Welcome to the Public Knowledge Policy Symposium for 2013. As I'm sure most of you know, we at Public Knowledge are a nonprofit consumer advocacy group that focus on consumer technology issues. And so while there are many, many issues being discussed in this building and very proximate to this building, we wanted with the new Congress and with the renewed administration to take some time to identify some of the issues that we thought were going to be very important for this year and going forward. And the goal of this event is not necessarily to solve any of these problems, although who knows, they may, uh, may figure it out in a half an hour, 45 minutes. But more importantly, to kind of flag the issues and begin to make sure that you understand why they are important and why they are worth focusing on. We've got a lot of content and not a lot of time, so I just want to give you a, a sense of the flow of the day. We have four panels and a lunchtime keynote address. The panels will begin with a, a panel discussing data caps, and data caps are important because no matter how great of a network you have, if you can't use it, it will not be the engine of innovation and information and access that we all want it to be. And so we need to find a way to both create those networks and keep those created networks useful. Uh, we'll then move on more broadly to the future of video. As many people in this room know, online video is a part of the future of video, but it's certainly not the end of the future of video. And there are a great number of rules regarding video, and as video begins to converge around uh, a limited, more limited number of distribution platforms, we really need to think about what, uh, what that means and how we can make sure that it develops as freely and efficiently as possible. We'll then transition to a lunch keynote discussing probably the most important telecom issue that no one outside of Washington knows about, the PSTN transition, the transition from the phone network, uh, the historical phone network to a more IP-based one. And this is going to be an issue that is with us for some time, but is important to get right early, because if you don't get it right early, you can't get it right uh, medium and later. And then in the afternoon, we're going to switch from telecom to the world of IP. And I think it's no secret that this town has become aware over the last year or so that there are two sides of the debate around copyright and copyright policy. And so what we want to do with, with the first panel after lunch is really talk about how copyright is impacting people who are, who are operating in the real world and who are innovators and creators and users and think about ways that we can really optimize the balance of copyright to make sure that we encourage and reward innovation and creativity uh, on all sides. And then finally, we're going to wrap up with a panel on what may be the, the copyright equivalent of the PSTM, the most important copyright issue that uh, very few people outside of Washington, or very few people inside of Washington, for that matter, are aware of. And that is the future of first sale. The Kurt Sang case at the Supreme Court right now is touching on first sale in the world of, of physical things, specifically books that were made overseas. And that's, a, that's an important element of what we're talking about. What we're really talking about is the almost imperceptible erosion of some of the balances that are key to the world of copyright. As we move from this uh, physical first to a digital first world, a lot of the assumptions, the ability to, to sell or gift or give away or do whatever you want with the things that you buy gets harder and harder. And so we're trying to identify now what it means when those things change and what we can do to find a way to maintain the balance without being trapped in a world where we say, well, it used to be this way and therefore it has to be this way forever. So that's a, sort of a very quick overview of the kind of things we're going to do. But since we, we do have limited time, I want to invite up the first panel uh, to talk about data caps. So uh, please come on up, folks. And as I said, we wanted to, to kick off uh, today's symposium with data caps because data caps are one of these issues that have a real practical effect on the way people use the internet. And there's a lot of discussion about broadband penetration and broadband speeds. 
but a, a network that is available everywhere that is as fast as anyone could ever want isn't particularly useful if you can't use it for anything or if you can only use it for the things that have only been created today and the things that tomorrow won't, won't work on it. So we're focusing specifically on this panel on online video, not because online video is the only place that data caps were relevant, but because data, online video is the place that it's easiest to see and understand the impact of data caps. They're sort of the canary in the data cap coal mine. And so I want to quickly introduce our panel and then, and then get on to the questions. Um, I will let them introduce themselves, but I will just go down the line. First, we have a Jenny Powell, who is the producer of the, should I be embarrassed to say, addictive uh, online show, The Busy Bennett Diaries, that I, uh, I spent my weekend binging on on the Amtrak train, uh, and I'll let her uh, explain what that is and why uh, someone like me, maybe you may not should be embarrassed to watch a bunch of uh, you know, young women on YouTube dancing around. Uh, <laughs> and he's also the director of content for VidCon, that sounded much worse than it is. Uh, and then Ryan Troy, who's the senior director of business development for Boxy, which is uh, one of these services that are really trying to use uh, the internet and the cloud to change the way that we watch probably largely more traditional video sources, although much more expansive than that. And then John Vazina, who's the political director of the Writers Guild of America West, and uh, who represents people who want to be in, who are, who are creating shows, and want those shows to get out uh, every way humanly possible, I imagine. And so uh, look to see online video distribution as, uh, as one of those ways. But quickly, just uh, I'll give you each a minute to introduce yourselves and explain why you uh, came all the way down to the Capitol Visitor Center this morning to talk about data caps. Uh, hi, I'm Jenny Powell. Uh, the Lizzie Bennett Diaries is a modern day adapta adaptation of Pride and Prejudice done video blog style, so the characters speak directly to the camera, uh, they interact with the audience, um, and then VidCon is the world's largest online video conference. Um, the reason I came down here today is because through VidCon and my work in the online video community, um, issues that affect creators are very, very uh, important to me and I'm passionate about fighting for their rights, um, and so data capping is something that personally affects them. So. I'm Ryan Troy. Uh, Boxy is a software company that um, has developed a cloud-based EDR that enables you to record free-to-air um, TC signal television. Um, and we have two boxes that we've uh, launched with our partner D-Link. Um, and we blend in a, a seamless UI both your recordings from free-to-air television and your over-the-top applications like Netflix and YouTube and the like. My name is John Vazina. As Michael said, I'm the political director at the Writers Guild of America West. Two and a half years ago, I left Senator Begich's office to move to LA to take this job. And just before I left, some friends, I had dinner to say goodbye with some friends. And I said, oh, we're going to invite a friend who just moved here from LA so that you know he can tell you a little bit there. You can tell him about here. And as we sat down to dinner, the guy said, oh, you're going to work for the communists. And um, little did I know at that time. But we are. Um, you know, it's interesting as I take this, as I took the job and as we do more in this area, that people sort of think of Hollywood um, as monolithic, that everyone in Hollywood thinks piracy is more important than net neutrality, that no one in Hollywood, especially content creators, can't discern the difference of um, why it's important, example, for writers to be able now that conglomerates own all the distribution and all the production to have independent ways to get directly to the public with their, with what they do. So that's why I'm here and that's why writers are involved because probably more than anyone, um, you know, people may be in love with Brad Pitt, but if you hear him talk when a writer hasn't written what he's saying, it's not quite so fascinating. And so getting what writers do directly out to the public is more and more important. So I'm going to get to, to data cap specifically in a second, but I want to first talk, have you talk a little bit about online video, because I think for some people, we're at a weird moment right now where for some people, online video is something they're engaging with every day, and for some people, it is something they are only peripherally aware of. So you all have three different interesting perspectives about this. We just sort of explain how you see online video, its relationship with other more traditional video distribution platforms and where it kind of fits in that equation? 
Uh, so you mean like television and film? Yeah. Or, um, I mean, for me personally, uh, I've always taken online video as just an extension of an additional form of that entertainment can take. Um, it's kind of, you, you know, it's changed a lot since, you know, it first started with people putting like their personal videos on YouTube into a storytelling and um, like a legitimate storytelling device. Um, online video tends to, just from an entertainment perspective, is usually more first person based, although scripted does also exist. Um, a lot of times they coincide, such as my show, which is done in vlog format but is scripted. Um, it tends to be a little bit shorter, but that again, that's changing. Um, I mean, as the technology gets better, it'll continually evolve. Um, so yeah, I guess that's would be my short answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, at Boxy, uh, we look at online video as a, a means to watch kind of when you what you want, when you want, where you want. So um, uh, outside of obviously the traditional theater, you can now access through the web, uh, everything on multiple screens. So the three screen track strategy of the 10 foot UI on your television, the two foot UI on your uh, tablet, um, or I guess the three foot UI on your, um, on your laptop. And so, um, you know, when you are receiving all of that uh, content over uh, IP, obviously the amount of bandwidth you consume will be increased. Um, and so, we are seeing more and more uh, programming um, take advantage of that, uh, companion viewing, where there's broadcast television with a companion application that also has parallel video content going on. Um, and so people like ourselves who are focused on kind of unifying that user interface um, and enabling people to kind of pivot between the Netflix application and their vision, it's, it's key to us that uh, they have access to as much data as possible. You know, it, it won't surprise any of you because you're the viewing public, um, as I am, that unless you're Quentin Tarantino or maybe Ben Affleck, it's very difficult to get something new made, something different. And so online to our members is in, in a couple of ways both the future and vitally important to protect. Um, for example, we have a member named Dennis Leone, he's Hispanic, really frustrated at the way he saw Hispanics portrayed on television. Um, he would go and do pitches to the networks, and because he didn't want to tell a story in the way that the networks believed Hispanics lived, um, he, he couldn't sell anything. So he created a web series called Los Americans. Um, if you haven't seen it, it there were eight episodes, and um, it's you know, 17, 20 minutes an episode, really good, um, the good production values, well done, and um, quickly it built up a good audience, and he was approached by Univision and by PBS about perhaps serializing it and bringing it to television. That never would have happened, he would never, never would have built that audience, those people would never have known who he was or that there was this different perspective without that online ability to go directly to viewers. So, you know, for writers, being able to um, make sure that that's there and the future of that, especially, you know, the other thing that um, we cover, obviously screenwriters and television writers, but the newest group that we've organized are video game writers. And a lot of people don't think about how video games are written. Those are all storylines. And more and more, for those young people who are playing huge games that take huge amounts of um, data, they often store it in the cloud and bringing it down, making sure that, um, that those caps don't mean that on the 23rd of, you know, or today, the 26th of February, you're in the middle of a game and suddenly you hit a data cap. Super important. Yeah, I want to get to the audience question first, but Jenny, I mean, you had a, a story from just last night about, um, you know, sort of mass, mass hysteria around data caps. Just, uh, we were commissioned outside, but very quickly, what, uh, what happened to you last night? So I got in pretty late last night, and I was trying to check in, and there was a crowd of people just hovered around the, the uh, check-in desk, and I was like, what's going on? And they were all like, you said it was complimentary, like, why isn't it working? Um, they had shut off our Wi-Fi in the hotel because they, as they, they, the company said, too many people were streaming video. So they just called the hotel and said, hey, you hit your data cap, you're done. And so this poor guy was trying to tell these, this crowd of people, like explain to them what was going on and they just didn't understand because to them they're like, well you said it was complimentary, therefore we should have access to it. 
And so, building off that, I want to, you know, each of you, and you all have interesting different perspectives on this, but when you talk about kind of finding video online, you know, if, if I want to, if someone tells me about a new TV show, I sort of check it out and I do whatever I do, I mean, what is the kind of the discovery and experimentation process for people finding, I mean, in some cases, not only a new show, but a new way to watch a show or a new way to interact with shows that they've been watching for some time. What is that kind of acquisition progress, that process? How do people build up the habit of online video? You know, I actually think um, taking the um, incredibly scientific demographic of my Facebook friends, <laughs> um, I think um, House of Cards on Netflix mm -hmm. is going to be a total game changer. Um, it is unbelievable to me how many of my friends are um, binge viewing and not eating for 13 hours in a row and not leaving their couch and bed sores on the medical problem. Now we need Obamacare to take care of this. Um, how many people are watching that? And how many of my, people, my friends, when they've seen me talk about it or other friends talk about it, they're like, oh, I can't order this on DVD. And so it's, it's this new way of doing things that people are, um, <clears throat> are going to experiment with. I think it's an introduction. And I think um, as people look at you know, the subject we're talking about, data caps, um, when they and other, you know, when Amazon starts streaming, when other groups start um, doing independent production that's really good, and you know, I have to say, self-disclosure, House of Cards is covered, and it's one of, you know, they signed our basic, um, minimum basic agreement, so it's a Writers Guild member who's writing it. Um, that is so good for writers, but I think also for the public and the way in which, you know, my 81-year-old mother loved the British version, I think because she's retired, she'd watched everything Netflix had on streaming, so she went back to DVD. Now she's going to go back to streaming because she really wants to see this, and um, her good citizen son won't give him her password so that she can watch it at home. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that we're on the verge of a big explosion of people figuring it out. And the other thing I have to say is my friends who are half my age, they don't want to watch things, um, even on DVR, when they're sort of told to. They want, you know, if it's 2 a.m. and they want to stream it, that's when they want to watch it. And I think that that user friendliness is going to have a huge impact. Absolutely. I think at Boxy, we, we focused on bringing the DVR into the cloud to uh, move away from those limits, um, both in storage capacity, uh, we offer an unlimited DVR, but also the ability to access that. Uh, since it's in the cloud, um, you can stream. Uh, kind of wherever you are. So um, any signal that's coming to your home, you can access that in and outside of the home, um, which, you know, before joining Boxy, I was at Netflix, and we saw kind of consumption patterns around this binge um, where people would pivot from the living room to the bathroom to the bus, um, and I think that that's a trend that's going to continue to grow as content uh, becomes available. Um, it's just a, it's a question of kind of uh, accessibility, and clearly data caps is part of that. Right. Yeah, I think with online video, a lot of it is about um, the way that people consume it and the fact that um, a lot of web series do have that regular like release pattern where they have a schedule. Like, for instance, Lizzie Bennet Diaries, we have content that comes out Tuesdays, or Mondays and Thursdays. So our hardcore fans who are watching it on a weekly basis, they do have that traditional experience of, oh my gosh, it's coming out at 9 a.m., let's all be there. But also, there are other groups that, you know, they wait till a certain amount of content is out, and then they can go consume it in one full chunk, as opposed to, you know, with some television shows, ones that aren't available on Netflix or Hulu, you're kind of beholden to when the show comes out. Like, you know, it's it's an event, you have to make sure you're there, everyone needs to be there at the same time. Um, online video is kind of opening that up. So, you know, you could have a House of Cards watching party on a Saturday night at 3 a.m. if you wanted to. Like, there's no reason not to. Um, so I think that's really, it, it's, online video is opening up the way we consume media. And I mean, just let's take Lizzie Bennett specifically. Who, who are these people? I mean, who is watching this show? How many of them are there? Uh, what do you add? You, you're you're smiling. Who are, who are these guys? I know. Yeah, I know. Who, are these guys? Who, who, who is who is your your audience? And then when you project forward, I mean, you're producing a lot of uh, online shows right now. When you project forward, what does that audience look like? How big is that audience in you know in two years or in five years? Sure. Um, Lizzie Bennett Diaries. Uh, another great thing about online video, and especially for us, we release solely on YouTube. 
Um, we have access to YouTube analytics, which literally tell us exactly who is watching, when they're watching, when they stop watching. Um, we are 90% female. And it's 90% 18 to, we say 18 to like 25, but it skews younger. Um, it's like young women. Um, Technically, we don't have analytics on that because you're not supposed to be on YouTube if you're under a certain age, but they are anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, you know, we built this content for fans of Pride and Prejudice, and that predominantly is women, and we knew that. Um, so our advertising skews that way, um, all of that. Um, I know other shows that have the exact opposite. Like I used to work for Philip DeFranco, who's a very prolific online creator, and his audience is the exact opposite. And his is 90% male. So that's another great thing about online video and the, the things we're creating is if you're using the tools that the online um, platform gives you, you, you can know exactly who your audience is. You can start to create for them. Um, when you go to a video, there's a viewer count that tells you exactly how many people watched it. I mean, that's an entire other discussion because what is a view? <laughs> but what, what did those numbers look like? I mean, how many people watch an average episode? Um, we're averaging uh, 150 to, to 200,000 per episode, and that's two episodes per week. Um, I think last I saw we're up to about 12 million views. Uh, episode 100 of our show came out yesterday, which was my birthday, so that was nice. Um, and we are WGA, so. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, I mean, this, this is sort of not a, an insignificant number of, of no. people, right? This is not, it's, it, is, it is niche, maybe it's niche compared to you know, cable television, but it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, we pretty, pretty early on started having people knocking on our door saying, oh, hey, you're relevant, and we're like, well, we, we'd hoped so, but I'm <laughs> glad you agree. <laughs> and, and John, I mean, when you were, you were talking about how you have members who kind of wanted to tell a story, couldn't find a way to do it, and then did it online, and then, and then kind of got picked up with traditional, in a traditional distribution channel. When your members are thinking about this, are they seeing it as an end or as a way in or as some hybrid of the two? Is that sort of evolving right now? I think it's evolving. It's very much, you know, for writers, it's very much a nascent technology, and that it's not. It's just very recently that it's been able to be monetized. That either people will pay something to watch, you know, some small amount to watch what you're doing, or that we know that the networks are starting to look at um, at what um, at what people are watching and and seeing like something gets a lot of hits, they start paying attention and talking to the writer, and not maybe even about that show, but about maybe, oh, we like the way you do things. Um, there might be other opportunities for you here. Um, there is, you know, I know this conversation is not about piracy, but there is um, within the guild um, a minority, but people who are worried about net neutrality and what that means for piracy. And more and more, um, I would say our more educated members, are pushing back and saying, this is really a way to fight piracy. If you use the internet to deliver things to people, say they don't want to go to a film at 6, 8, or 10 on a Friday night, they want to watch it at 2 a.m., and you figure out a way to, to wirelessly or wireline to deliver it to them in their home and say, charge $5 for something that's not crap held on a handheld camera in a theater in Kazakhstan, um, that you're probably going to get people um, that way, and that's going to bring down piracy mm -hmm. because there's no reason to then pirate. So, you know, we had this internal conversation about those issues because, of course, um, our members get money from residuals when things are shown legally. Um, so that's really important to us. But I think more and more, I've had members say to me recently, you know, we we lost financial syndication. We've lost a lot of independent production. Um, DVDs are going the way um, of the dinosaur. We cannot be here in 20 years looking back and having members saying, why didn't you fight for the internet? Why did you let people close it down? So, I mean, that's one reason I flew out here for this. It's because, um, you know, we see data caps as um, the camel under the, um, the tent, the camel's nose under the tent to a certain extent. And, you know, we think there are better ways to to control things. Why did you decide that way you wanted to structure your DVR, you could have gone the more traditional route, you, you did go the more traditional route at one point. Um, why did you decide that it was 
the cloud infrastructure was the way you wanted to do this. So again, um, the beauty of, of DVR is you, know, you can watch what you want when you want. Um, and having to battle in a household amongst family members over a limit and the anxiety and the teeth grinding that takes place for some of us um, that maybe watch too much television um, about who's recording what, when, and how many tuners does the device have, and how many how many shows can I actually record by moving to the cloud? Um, um, you have unlimited uh, storage capabilities. Um, it's uh, we work with with Amazon, um, with the same services that Netflix uses. Uh, it's completely scalable. Um, and not only do you get unlimited recording, but you now also have the ability um, to, again, watch kind of where you want as well. Um, and so the cloud has that, that, that flexibility, the infrastructure has caught up, um, and you know, the streaming services, um, both subscription and VOD, have kind of laid the groundwork. Um, and you know, it's just the natural extension, we think, of the television viewing experience, or the, the video viewing experience is to, um, kind of give you that, that celestial jukebox, if you will, of uh, what you want when you want, and the cloud is a natural step in that direction. So we talked a little bit now about online video and kind of where it is, a little bit where it's going, but I want to bring it back now to the, to the subject of the, the essential subject of the panel, which is data caps. Mm -hmm. And where, how, how can data caps impact the way people find online video and how they see it as a part of their viewing diet. I mean, what's what's the relationship there? I think there's two sides to look at it. There's um, the viewing public, like how it affects them, and then the creators themselves, because it does affect the creators themselves. I'll start with that. Um, I mean, in order to do what these online creators do, who are often uploading large amounts of data every day because their audiences want that content, um, if they hit a data cap, it's not just affecting their livelihood in the fact that they're not getting their content out there, which they can then monetize, and you know it's their livelihood, uh, but it affects their entire audience who wants to see this content. So it's a huge issue on the creator side because it's essentially keeping them from being able to do their job. Some of these people, this is their this is their full-time job, this is what they do. Um, and then from the viewing side, um, hitting data caps means, again, you can't consume that, that material you would like to when you want to. Um, and in terms of discovery, like once you can't be online at all, no discovery is happening whatsoever. <laughs> so it's a complete block of that ability. Right. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, from our perspective, data caps uh, limit innovation in an ecosystem that is uh, changing very quickly. And uh, from our perspective, uh, all participants, um, content creators and, and writers, uh, the production companies, um, those that own those rights and sell that content, uh, and those that deliver that content, um, as well as the advertisers that help fund that, can all benefit um, from an increase in data consumption and video consumption. And, um, I think, you know, it's frankly un-American to um, find a good that has to be limited um, and put limitations on a particular good. And if you look at data as being a particular good, um, you know, in a capitalist society, we should be able to offer that and make that available for consumers. And, you know, the rate in which they pay, that that's the free market will dictate, but to kind of put these uh, caps in place um, will, will you know, limit the innovation that um, will grow the entire ecosystem. What they said. Um, <laughs> you know, for us it's, um, and I, I like the way you said that, it just seems like we get a mindset about managing for scarcity rather than abundance. And so, you know, we already know for wireless that, you know, we're, we have to pay more. We're looking. I have friends who look at all the, at their um, their limits, and they they're like, oh, I can't stream that movie in HD. I can't do whatever because they they worry about that. And for us, you know, for writers to have that ability to to get their their content out to the public and not having people second guess, especially if there are discriminatory caps where you know. You know, say for example, people aren't doing Netflix because um, if they watch something over their Xbox, it's not getting counted against their cap. 
that that hurts innovation. It hurts. It certainly hurts creators who want to get as much out to the public as they can in as many ways. Um, I I really think, you know, a lot of these companies have monopolies already. That they, they were given this um, these areas, and so people don't have choice. And so you have a cable company that you basically have to have, and then they say, well, it's great that you want to stream um, 20 hours of um, of HD content a month, but that's going to hit a cap. Or you're on a college campus and you have five or six people who are roommates in a house. And how quickly, if they're all looking at things on their own devices, do they run against these caps? It's definitely going to, the creation is going to suffer. Um, and for writers, having already bumped up against studios who tell them exactly what to make and how they're going to make it, um, to have that creativity taken away and even further limited by how much people can watch, it's, it's you know, as you said, I think it's anti-American, it's anti-capitalist. You know, we should be managing for, um, for a lot. I want to touch on a little bit what you said about that sort of that relationship, and I wonder if this is something that we talked earlier about kind of the relationship between online video and other distribution methods. When you're thinking about, this is probably Jenny Ryan a little bit more in your, in your area, but when you're thinking about um, other people's other options and the fact that in some ways you are competing against cable or some, you know, someone like cable or, or other out, traditional outlets, and those are also the companies that you in some ways rely on because your viewers need to use that high-speed internet connection. Is there is there thinking about the the kind of the, the weird relationship you can have with a cable company that's also an ISP that may also have data caps, or is that something that people are still kind of working their way through? Or you know, Ryan, you're you're in some in some ways you are competing with video on demand and other traditional DVRs. The people who you're competing with are also the people that your customers are relying on to access your service. Is that is that a discussion that's happening yet, or is that a uh, sort of a, a little bit too abstract. No, no. It, so it's definitely a discussion that's happening. It's not, um, we, we, and we're embracing all all participants. Sure. Actually, uh, uh, an, an MSO that has an ISP service is the perfect partner for us. Um, you know, we think data, the margins on data are far better than licensing content. Um, but uh, we don't view ourselves as competing really with anyone. We're trying to facilitate um, and innovate and kind of listen to what consumers want and, and keep up with the demand uh, and just make it easier for them. Um, from our perspective, uh, someone that can sell data subscription services and broadband um, uh, can make a very, very, very uh, rich um, profit on someone who's consuming data um, you know, uh, through online video um, and advertisers as well. Um, so yeah, we don't, we don't view it as there being any sort of real conflict. Like no, 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 no. And then I guess the one other thing that I wanted to ask is specifically with your service, I think yeah. that a lot of times when we talk about um, the way networks operate, um, one of the things that, uh, one of the arguments that some kind, sometimes gets trotted out is that um, you, if you're a company, you should pay to access, you, you, you're, using, you're using the network infrastructure and so you should have to pay to do that. I mean, Jenny, for you, you're sort of, you're, you're using, you, it was a distribution platform, so those costs, they exist. They exist on the, the royalties and the ad cut that you get. Um, but Ryan, I mean, is your cloud service free to you to run? Uh, you know, no, you, you, no <laughs> this, this, this it's, it's not. It, it's it's worth, it's worth mentioning. I mean, it yeah, is, there's, the streaming is expensive. Mm -hmm. Storage is less expensive, but expensive. Um, uh, innovating um, software is expensive as well. Um, but there, I think through that innovation, there are ways, it's different maybe than the way um, traditional media and broadcasters um, and advertisers have made money, but there is a great deal um, more money um, available, we think, for all the parties. Um, it's just as a matter of kind of the infrastructure catching up, and certainly the back end is there. Um, you know, I don't, we're not, you know, based on the number of hours and data that Netflix is consuming, we're not seeing, you know, network fall over. I think there's plenty of dark fiber out there. So the infrastructure argument, um, I think, is moot. Um, 
I think really where there's room for a lot of innovation is around both the windowing and availability of content to keep up with <coughs> consumer demand. And that's what we're trying to do with our DVR. So, you know, linear free to air television, 89 of the top 100 shows are available free to air. Um, and many folks just aren't taking advantage of it. We're trying to show them that, hey, you, there's all this great content in HD um, that you can access. Um, and, you know, you're going to have to pay for broadband, obviously. Um, and if someone wants to um, pay a great deal for that, so be it. And the market will dictate what the price will be. But we look to legislators to um, help preserve that innovation mm -hmm. and uh, just ensure that, um, you know, uh, that the ecosystem can be fostered across the board and keep up with consumer demand. And then uh, we're going to get some questions from the audience in a second, but I wanted to sort of uh, end this part by just asking you when you when you project out, when you think about what this world looks like uh, in an idealized sense in a year or two years or even five years, what does the online video world look like? Uh, it, assuming there are no restrictions and you can sort of do what you want and consumers re react positively. Where, what does the world look like? I mean, how different is it than it is right now? I think the concept of windowing uh, will go away, um, where you will not run into um, kind of availability issues. I think mm -hmm. discovery, stuff like meta search, cross provider search, where you're able to search different uh, for a particular writer across different providers. Um, whether that be available through free air television or on your DVR or through a VOD service or through a subscription service, um, that will become uh, much easier uh, and much more fluid. And um, again, I think viewership will just continue to rise. Um, the concept of the long tail, I think, will exist. Um, and that will continue to grow as, as people go back and discover old, uh, full, episodic stuff and, and binge consume. Um, I just discovered The Wire uh, on my train ride. Yeah, right. Yeah. This little show you may have heard of. Yeah. Um, and jeopardize a relationship through it. But um, <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, so I think that um, uh, international boundaries, I think, will start to, uh, as demand for more content um, increases, uh, content providers and the license holders will, um, I think, be more motivated to transcend. Um, those borders, and uh, again, I think uh, the concept of windowing will start to erode as consumers have the ability to pivot and jump between um, availability. The DSLR like completely changed what creators could do. They could shoot high quality HD video without like having to spend a lot of money for it. And I think you know, as the technology continues to get better, we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, creators will be able to create more content, more high quality content. Um, I think I agree with you, House of Cards is going to be a huge game changer. Um, more long form, high premium content is kind of the buzzword right now. I think it's going to continue to grow as, um, you know, these online video, um, um, the more traditional media companies are investing more in the space, uh, more advertising money is coming in, and it's just making it so these creators can um, create more, just more content, better content. Um, to match the high viewership that is going to continue to happen. I should also add, I think that tune-in events will also become actually more popular. Yeah, I agree. Um, because there is a type of viewing where you want to do as a group. Um, you know, sporting events, uh, presidential debates, um, those, those events uh, will, I think, obviously continue and actually they focus on them because they will become community um, experiences that the entire family does as opposed to you know this child is watching this series and dad's watching this and mom has these shows that she tunes into um, but the actual live events uh, that will that's not going away um, and I think that the focus and values of those will only increase um, because they will truly become differentiated uh, from the kind of uh, episodic um, content which will be less tuned in yeah, mainly because I don't have a life. On President's Day, I watched eight of the ten episodes of um, Game of Thrones second season. And um, that came after watching probably half of um, House of Cards on at home also. Yeah, no life. And um, 
and not having to worry about caps is what I pay, being able to do that. Um, and, and, you know, and I think it's actually good business. I am now, because I'm caught up with Game of Thrones, I'm going to pay for HBO starting next month when the third season starts because I was able to catch up in a way that um, I can no longer wait another year to see um, the third <laughs> season. Um, the other thing for um, content creators, we have a member named Tom Schulman who won the Academy Award for Dead Poets Society. Later stage in his career, he is looking at the internet in ways that he can take what he does directly to the public. And I think as you have established writers um, and other um, content creators who look for new ways to get what they do, and you know, and again, he's an Academy Award winning screenwriter, to have that ability to go directly to the public with something maybe edgy or maybe not edgy, but something that um, he can't get made any other way because you know someone's making Battleship the movie. Um, I, I think I would hope in a couple of years that we protected net neutrality um, to a level that that all of this product can go directly to the public, and maybe not at a level where a network would have to have, but at a level where a million Americans are watching or two million Americans. Um, you know, if you um, there's a, a LA sort of industry rag called The Wrap, and you can, every morning if you subscribe, they'll send you the viewership for the night before and which network came in first. And um, you know, you'll see some of the shows perhaps that you really like, and they've got six million viewers, and they're probably gonna get canceled um, because they're the, the lowest rated. And you know, six million Americans, if you can do that because you protect the internet in something like The New Normal or a show like that can maybe find an audience that way or Arrested Development that's gonna be on um, Netflix, I think that that's good for the country. Absolutely. So we're handing out cards. If you uh, if you have a question, please put down a card and uh, let us know, and we'll we'll pick them we'll pick them up. Um, and I guess I so while while people are, are writing, you mentioned kind of this this idea. And I apologize. This is, feels like out of left field, but this idea between kind of appointment collective viewing and the sort of shattering of uh, a co of collective viewing because you know a, a show goes on, is on tomorrow but I'm not going to watch it for two years when I discover it somewhere when you're thinking about creating shows and about kind of the world or the culture that, is, that revolves around uh, video today do you worry about that fracturing reaching a point where there's where you lose kind of cultural coherence at all or do you see it as being a, you know, kind of each to their own but then it's all that much more important when we come together for whatever that that that, that big event viewing is. Um, how do you? I mean, how do you how do you think about that? If, if to the extent that you think about it at all. <laughs> I think that the books people read tend to be personal, um, uh, based on where they are at that stage um, of the day or their lives. Um, whereas watching a sporting event is something you do not kind of in private. That as a group because cheering on for that kind of common denominator is key. And so um, I think as ad models start to evolve and, and catch up uh, with consumer um, behavior, content creation is already on its way. Um, and we're just kind of at the beginning where they will start to melt. But um, I, I do not think we're going to lose uh, our cultural identity. I mean, we're not a homogenized society. So to think that we all want to watch the same thing. You know, eight o'clock on Sunday is, is is not, I think, very uh, accurate. So I think it will just evolve. Um, well, and I don't think there's anything wrong with, um, you know, for lack of a better term, off group, offbeat groups of people who come together around. You know, maybe it's not your friends. My friends would be very pleased to say they don't share my sense of humor. Um, but maybe that you know, I find an online community, or I find you know there. Are, I don't think it has to be shared across millions of people. It could be shared across a few and still have value. And sure, you know, we're going to address some of those uh, issues on this panel. But you know, we're on the Hill. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there's a really technical part of all of this, too. Um, the House Energy and Commerce hearing that was held the other day which was called Satellite Video 101, illustrates this. And uh, you know, it touched on mechanisms for measuring markets, calculating royalties, distant versus local signals, the economics of spot beaming satellite signals, and so on. If you multiply these technical issues by 10, for cable, for retransmission consent, for program access and program carriage, 
and so on. You get an idea of what it's like to dive deep into how the government has shaped the video marketplace. Uh, the fact is that the television and video marketplace is highly regulated, not always in way, not always in ways that benefits consumers, and the future of video could depend a lot on exactly how those regulations are shaped. Uh, a lot of the rules that are in place today are designed to protect one part of the industry against another. Uh, Different parts of the industry often fight with each other, but they often seem to coexist. The retransmission consent system, which gives control over NDPD uh, use of broadcast signals, uh, you know, it, it puts it in the hands of uh, local broadcasters instead of the actual content creators. And as a result, even though most people watch broadcast signals uh, over cable, you know, we still have broadcasters, uh, you know, transmitting over the air. And on top of that, you have a plethora of uh, internet and copyright related issues that come up when you start looking at video. And uh, a lot of those are being dealt with other panels today. But uh, just let me get to my panelists real quick. So today we have two industry representatives, uh, Allison Mania from Dish Networks and uh, Rachel Welch from uh, Time Warner Cable. And we have uh, Adam Fear from the Mercatus Center. So uh, here's a funny thing about Adam. He wrote a blog post recently titled, My Next Seven Law Review Articles on the Tech Liberation Front blog. So that should give you an idea about how prolific he is uh, in writing about these tech policy issues. So I'm just going to start with some questions for everyone. Uh, first of all, um, with Stella up for reauthorization, now that is what the other hearing the other day was about, which is uh, the law, which expires soon, which allows satellite video to essentially uh, continue operating. So Allison, I was wondering if you could just give me a little bit of background on that, and then I'm going to go down the panel and ask the panelists if they think that, you know, since video issues are going to have to be addressed by Congress one way or the other, if DISH and DirecTV are going to continue operating, you know, what are the odds that it's just going to be a, a really simple reauthorization of that law, or whether, uh, you know, there's a chance for more substantial reform. So, Allison? Sure. Well, um, thanks very much, John, and thank you to Public Knowledge for hosting this event. This is um, a really exciting time in the video business, and you know, definitely appreciate the chance to have uh, a conversation about it. Um, so Stella expires at the end of next year, and um, yeah, the satellite reauthorization is the only must-pass legislation, um, telecom legislation for this session. So it's a tremendous opportunity to take a fresh look at some of these issues that affect satellite carriers, cable providers, broadcasters, and most importantly, consumers. Um, Stella is important, but you know, one thing I will say is that um, as a result of the last round of legislation, the uh, copyright license that allows Dish and DirecTV to offer local broadcast stations back into their <coughs> local markets does not sunset, uh, and that's an important point. But uh, one of the things that does need to be reauthorized is uh, the distance signal licensing. You know, it should be front center in this discussion. Yeah, and uh, let's step back a second. Why is it that there needs to be a special law to allow satellite, or there's a similar provision for cable, to carry broadcast signals? I mean, uh, when Time Warner Cable or Dish wants to carry ESPN or MTV, you just sort of go to the rights holder and you sign a contract and you carry it, and bam, it's taken care of. So, you know, what is the deal with this cumbersome, you know, having to have a law periodically passed in order to allow you to continue to carry broadcast stations? Why are broadcast stations treated so differently than uh, other kinds of content? Um, well, I think, you know, there's a lot of, again, to John, thank you very much for having the panel. I'm happy to be here this morning to talk about what are really complicated issues and have a long history. So um, if you go back into the 50s, 60s, 70s even, um, that's really where the, at least the cable um, regulatory regime grew up. And the copyright issues have always long been intertwined with the Communications Act issues. So um, you know, going back to the Fort Knightley case, the teleprompter case, in, you know, I think it was 68 and 74, you have these situations where the, the rights owners were always having concerns about whether or not um, the cable companies needed a license or not, whether what they did was a performance under the copyright law. The Supreme Court decided twice that it wasn't a performance and that the cable companies did not need to get a specific license or, or provide payment to the rights owners um, for rebroadcasting um, the broadcast stations. What they really saw it as, from a technology point of view, was extended rabbit ears. So um, essentially cable um, took from over the air in local markets, um, and sometimes from distant markets, um, broadcast stations, and they put wires, um, not very pretty, um, across um, hills and landscapes to people and provided them 
clear broadcast signals where otherwise they couldn't receive them or got really um, crummy, um, you know, white noise signals. And so that was where this all started. Um, and then after those two decisions, and during the same period while these decisions were being decided, the FCC was also getting involved in this. So again, you had the intersection of both copyright law and communications law even back 30 and 40 years ago. Once those decisions were, um, were finished, then the um, Congress intervened and said, you know what, we're going to take a look at the 1909 Copyright Act and we're going to update it. So, um, you know, I think a lot of us complain about 20-year-old laws. If you look back, you know, that was some 60 or 70-year-old law. So in 76, they put in place um, a Copyright Act that was a very delicate balance between the rights owners and the cable companies and other players in the market that said, you know, look, broadcast stations put a lot of things into their signal. Um, they could make it very difficult for cable systems to carry those signals by not clearing the rights and that they would be subject to liability for songs or jingles or different things that were carried into the signal. So the, so the, um, the mechanism that they came up with back in 76 was a compulsory copyright license. So for cable, we have both uh, local um, signal license and the distance signal license in a single place in section 111 of Title 17, and ours is permanent. Um, and you know, over the years that Stella's been reauthorized, the Copyright Office has been asked numerous times, um, how should we phase this out? How should we change it? And if you look at the um, Section 302 comments from the last round, um, the Stella reauthorization, it's a very difficult question. Um, you know, yes, uh, there are, we have seen that um, cable channels have grown up, and cable companies and satellite companies and overbuilders <laughs> and telecommunications providers now negotiate in a market environment and the cable um, programmer clears all of the rights and indemnifies the distributor um, for the carriage of those signals. For broadcasters, whether it's history, whether it's that um, for some small broadcasters in smaller markets they're less sophisticated and need more help, um, I think there's lots of questions for why there should be this difference, but a lot of it comes out of the history of how the copyright license was created for broadcast but wasn't created for cable. So for cable programmers, they, they basically had to come up and had to be creative entrepreneurs to come up with a way to clear the, broad, to clear the copyright um, licenses for everything in their signal, whereas the broadcasters from 76 on, you know, and before that, because there was no copyright license, didn't have to do it, and then 76 on, haven't had to do it. So if you think about the mom and pop broadcaster in the, in the number 210 market, you know, what sort of um, costs would that impose on them to clear all the rights if it was put onto the broadcaster? What sort of mechanism would you use? Would you use an ASCAP type of system? Would, would the um, responsibility be on the broadcaster? Would it be on the distributor, like a cable operator or a DBF provider? Those are all the complex questions. So I think time and time again, what we do is we come to the stellar reauthorization and people say, let's take a really hard look at these copyright issues. Um, and then they realize, they start peeling back the onion about just how complex and difficult these are to solve. Um, and there's so many players on the different sides of the issue that it's very hard to come to a solution. But essentially, um, you know, that's the history of how we got to where we are today. It's certainly not perfect. I think if any of us were to start with a blank sheet of paper today, we would come up with a very different system, both on the copyright side and on the communication side. Um, but this is what, you know, this is where you end up when there's a history behind it. I think from Cable's perspective, what we'd like to see with this stellar reauthorization is for, you know, a continued dialogue. We've had these each of the um, times that we've had the reauthorization, but we think there is a need for a careful look at what this, um, what this regime should look like, both on the copyright side and on the communication side with now um, at least three players in every market for video distribution, um, plus overbuilders, um, uh, and now with over-the-top online video providers coming in, what should the, what should the regulatory re you know, regime look like if over-the-top providers want access to, um, to content and, and need a compulsory copyright license? What else should happen on the, on the, um, on the Communications Act side of it? Um, are there Communications Act rules, um, regulatory underbrush that are no longer working? Um, you know, if you, if, you, if you did a Venn diagram of what's going on in terms of what applies to DISH, what applies to cable, what applies to over-the-top or online video providers, it's a very different um, regulatory regime. 
is there a need to regulate up a little bit some places, regulate down other places? And so I think what we'd like to see is a fulsome dialogue where people really dig into the details about this because is this the right regime for the 21st century? Um, I'm not sure that there's anybody um, today that would say that we've um, come up with the perfect solution here and maybe it's time for some tweaks. Yeah, so, so basically in the 1970s, uh, you know, the DC consensus started to be, okay, we've decided that cable systems need to have a copyright license in order to broadcast broadcast content. But look, it turns out that broadcasters actually are just broadcasting network content, syndicated content, stuff that they don't even really have the right to license further on to cable systems. While well, as the cable world, you know, HBO, always evolved in a world where they had to acquire all of those rights from the beginning. So we came up with this scheme of the of retransmission consent where you have to get the permission of the broadcaster, not the copyright permission, but just permission to retransmit their signal, while at the same time you pay a fee uh, to to cover you on the copyright side, and presumably content owners can get some of their money back from the stations. Uh, you know, it's 40 years later though, and you know, maybe if we picked differently in the 70s, by now broadcasters would be able to sublicense that content, but we sort of put it off for 40 years because we came up with this system. So I just want to ask Adam, is this, did we make the right policy choice in the 70s uh, to set up the system as it exists today? Uh, and what would you have done, were you in charge, to uh, solve this? You're still an old guy. Issue? I think I've agreed with everything you've said so far. So uh, first, let me thank you and Public Knowledge for inviting me here today. And first, what this panel proves to me is what I've known since my high school days, which women are scared of me. <laughs> I don't want to be too close, so I can live with that. Anyway, um, I, uh, I think you asked the right questions to frame this to start, John. You asked, why do we need uh, special laws to govern these issues? Um, and then secondly, is broad-based reform possible? And now you've asked a question like going back to the ancient history of this. And, you know, uh, it's crazy. I mean, the, the way this has unfolded is that one misguided intervention has got another and another and another, and now we're stuck with a regime that nobody quite understands and that we're all terrified is going to apply to new technologies and services. And, you know, this debate, you know, in a sense, you have to ask yourself, do you really believe in free market contracts? Do you really believe in traditional copyright? Do you believe also in antitrust? Because to the extent this debate is about people cutting deals, this happens every day in a marketplace. We have contracts for all sorts of other services, including in the video marketplace. To the extent this is about copyright, traditional copyright should be able to handle all of these issues the way it does in other contexts. Sure, there are going to be enforcement issues, but why do we need a special regime for certain types of content? The answer is we don't. And then third, to the extent this is about market power, local market power, whatever, we have antitrust laws to cover these things. So there are other remedies. We didn't need to create a convoluted regulatory regime. And all of these things, whether it's must carry and retrans and compulsory licensing and syndicated exclusivity and all these things, just layers and layers of rules that now threaten to bleed into the online ecosystem and apply to all the new technologies in town and really potentially hurt them. So what I'm optimistic about, however, is the fact that we have what economists and political scientists would call a perfect natural experiment going on in this marketplace. Natural experiment basically says, well, the hell with what lab studies say or what you know abstract theory says. What's got going on in the real world? For example, we have a wonderful natural experiment between capitalism, socialism, and North Korea and South Korea. We have a pretty good idea who's winning that. What's the natural experiment that's happening in this marketplace? Well, it's the fact that we don't have this regime covering a lot of these new services. And the fact of the matter is that deals get cut every minute of the day. That doesn't mean it's perfect. There are some blackouts. There are some problems with contractual negotiations. Dish and AMC had a little spat that lasted about three months last summer, and it got quite heated. But you know what? That's cutthroat capitalism. They eventually sealed the deal and got it in, and the content kept flowing. The reality is, is that we can work these deals out, that a huge market for rights aggregation is developed subsequent to the 76 Act. We didn't think things like HBO and Discovery and History and things like this would exist back then, but they now do, and they aggregate these rights and they sell them, and these markets work fairly well. So my hope is, why I'm a little bit optimistic here, even though reform in the Hill is going to be tough, is that more and more stuff is getting pushed into that box, and that's the way the world is working today. We just have to hope that it doesn't get encumbered with the old rules applied to the old analog world. Well, Stepping back though, how do you transition from the world we have now and also the world we had in the 70s where there was no requirement for cable systems to have copyright permission, so there was no one to go to 
really uh, the way there might be for a cable channel. So how do you transition from the current system, or what we had in the 70s, to the system that you would see as being ideal? Is it even possible? And the further question is, is it really worth it? I mean, uh, I don't have anyone from content uh, up here, unfortunately, but they often complain about the co compulsory license, saying that they don't get the full value of their content, and they, and they think that they would do better in the free market. But you know, they still cut deals with, with the stations, which then grant retransmission consent. So why can't they just get the full value of their content from someone else? I mean, I'm saying, yeah, it's a dumb system, it's convoluted, it's not what anyone would design, but is it really worth changing? And is it even changeable without having you know, years of disruption, which uh, would really not be beneficial? Well, well, of course there's going to be years of disruption, but really quick answer to this. You're making a great point, John, which is that right now the content community cuts a lot of deals with a lot of other players who just have this special set of rules mostly for broadcast-related content. But the reality is is that we know that those deals can be cut and they are every day in the marketplace. I'm astonished by the fact that a lot of folks in the content community have essentially abandoned this opportunity to get rid of something they've always regarded as sort of one of the original sins of this regulatory regime, which was compulsory licensing. But the, to answer your question, the way you deal with this is you say, you know, we remedy the problem that was in fortnightly. We basically say you, you do have to negotiate. A, a, a right a transaction with the content holders if you're a distributor. And then we let that go from there. We let them strike contracts. But you don't need to have all of these other layers of rules that encumber that process. So if you just get the copyright part of it right, and you have contracts that do that, I, I don't see what the problem is. I think then you just have something like the Minsk lease. You reform the rules, you get rid of them over a five-year transition, and you're done. <clears throat> okay. Rachel? Well, I was going to say, you know, be realistic it's it is pretty complicated to figure out exactly how you do it given all the interests but I think it, it is worth having the discussion about how you would um, address the changes and I think from our perspective the most important piece of this is that you don't do it in a vacuum so if you look just at the elimination of the copyright license but you retain the retransmission consent regime on the other side of the on the other side of the equation, so you eliminate section 111, 119, 122, and you say, look, broadcasters, um, figure it out, you know, clear these rights, and that's a question too. Does it fall onto the distributor side that we have to make sure that the rights are cleared? Do the broadcasters have to make sure it's cleared? Is it going to be some third party? So there's some mechanism questions about how you actually would um, execute it. Um, but if you do all that in, a, in the vacuum of Title 17 without looking at the Communications Act issues, um, you know, you haven't solved the problem. So if you're really looking to enable um, the, to take out kind of the middleman a little bit and allow the parties who have the rights to negotiate, you have to also look at syndicated exclusivity, sports blackout, retransmission consent. And it gets complicated, quite frankly. So if you look at um, the Stella reauthorization in the past, you have both the Judiciary Committee and the Commerce Committee trying to work this out. So I, I, what we are hopeful for is to see this, to have this dialogue. I think we're getting to a, a point where some of these systems are breaking down. So as Adam said, um, I, I think especially on the, on the, on the um, programming side, the cable programming side, we do see generally that, these, that the market transactions are working. On the retransmission consent side, where it is with the broadcasters, what we are seeing is increasing disruptions. So there are lots of people who are saying, wow, the compulsory copyright license is terrific, it works really well. I think there's a question mark there. Is it working? And is it working in conjunction with retransmission consent? Because what we're seeing is more disruption for consumers, less, you know, um, you know kind of continuous uh, uh, um, provision of the broadcast signal, which is was deemed so important by Congress. So, so asking these questions and then trying to figure out how do you navigate through the juggernaut of a Judiciary Committee jurisdiction and a Commerce Committee jurisdiction and, and all of the parties that would be interested in doing this. Can you do it in a two-year period? Unclear. Um, but certainly, I think we're at a, a point in time where these hard questions need to be asked and we need to be looking towards how we you know, reframe um, the regulatory uh, regime going forward. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Rachel said. And what I would add to that is, if you take away the compulsory copyright license, what's left is not a free market. That's not the result when you delete that one aspect of it because um, you know the retransmission, the must-carry slash retransmission consent regime that has been established ultimately doesn't work for the marketplace today. Um, you know, if, if 20 years ago there was one broadcaster and one pay TV distributor, distributor in the market, the situation was more like mutually assured destruction. You know, 
the, the broadcaster only had one option for a pay TV distributor to carry them, and a you know, pay TV distributor only had one option for NBC content in that market. Today it's different. Today there are, you know, in general, three pay TV distributors in each market. There's Dish, DirecTV, there's a cable operator, there may be somebody like Fios or Uverse. So um, if a broadcaster asks for, you know, a several hundred percent increase in the rates, and Dish doesn't, you know, want to pay those rates because we want to try to keep our service affordable, that broadcaster has, you know, three, four, maybe more um, alternatives. Um, to get their, their signal out, and then ultimately consumers are left in a bind because if they lose the, the station on DISH, yeah, they can switch to somebody else, but they incur all the switching costs and they you know, may lose some of the things that DISH offers, like the hopper that they really like. Um, so I definitely think that if we're going to re-examine the copyright license, we definitely have to look at all the things that come with it to make sure that what, what we end up with is what we hoped for. Yeah, so I think you've raised, both of you have raised the interesting point that it's very hard to change just one aspect of the current regime without looking at the other. For example, yes, I would, I would totally agree it would be very difficult to get rid of the compulsory license uh, without also looking at retransmission consent because now all of a sudden you have a, a, an MVPD that has to get permission from two sets of people that are to broadcast content and that seems to be uh, not ideal. But you know, we keep running into this problem where you have these temporary authorizations that allow satellite to exist and you kind of need to address that because I don't think anyone really wants DISH or DirecTV to have to stop operating, but at the same time, everyone seems to recognize that you need to have comprehensive reform and that it's really hard. So how do you square that? How do you take care of the short-term problem, you know, just to prevent temporary pointless disruption while also, you know, setting the stage to where the entire system <coughs> can be looked at again? So look, this was the unique genius of the Dominic Scalise approach, uh, which I, I'm assuming most people are familiar with the fact that there was a bill introduced by then Senator Dement and uh, Representative Scalise last year that basically tried to deal with this problem uh, by essentially saying, look, it's a game theory problem. You've got a lot of different players, a lot of different interests. What you have to do is ask everybody to give a little to get a little. And that means there's going to be some sacrifices, but there's also going to be some gains. So yes, compulsory licensing would go, and that would help content owners in the long run. Um, um, but on the other side, they would have to give up things like retrans and must carry and syndicated exclusivity and some other issues. That's the kind of reform that ultimately breaks this logjam. It doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, I mean, the reality is, I, I'm, I'm not naive. I mean, piecemeal reform is always going to usually trump things like this. But if you wanted to get it done, in theory, we have the model. That's it, Dominic Scalise, whether it has prospects of successful passages, <laughs> another map. <matter. laughs> yeah. Let's without, have an executive Without Dominic. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah well, that might be a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Um, I'm going to step back a little bit because I think that some of the rules that we see, uh, to my mind at least, are designed to protect one part of the industry against another. And you could just like go through the entire litany. You know, this is designed to protect content creators against cable. This is designed to protect broadcasters against content. This is designed to prevent MVPDs against each other, and so forth. Um, but you know, I want to I want to mention the broadcaster bit a little bit because I think it's really not a coincidence that the broadcasters maintain such a key uh, role in the 1970s and today in the rules, and that they seem to benefit a lot from things like syndicated exclusivity and uh, you know sports blackout rules or, or you know just go down the list and so you know who is really who benefits most from the current system like if you want to have the theory that the FCC and Congress is captured who is it captured by and for what purpose or is it just like this you know elaborate machine that sets different parts of the industry against each other where they're almost at a stalemate or is there someone who who gains more than more than everyone else and well, when government has its thumbs on both sides of the scale, everybody's interested in the result, right? I mean, the reality is that's what's happened, is that we've had Congress and the FCC trying to rejigger the balance of the scale after one intervention after the next. And this has been happening not just going back to the retrans uh, issue, not just back to compulsory licensing, not just back to must carry. It goes all the way back to the primal intervention of spectrum nationalization. And there you started a public interest regime that said we, the FCC, will make a lot of decisions about marketplace transactions. Now, I suspect I'll disagree with some of my friends of public knowledge about whether or not we should be <laughs> eliminating the nationalization of the spectrum and moving to property rights, but so be it. Let's understand that, that once we got the ball rolling, that's you know the bed we're not laying in. But again, how do we get out of it? How do we get out of this problem? I think it requires a comprehensive type of reform that basically says that the FCC will not have a thumb on either side of the scales, that will move all of this into a free market contractual regime, but one that essentially both honors copyright and understands that antitrust is there as a backstop. 
and we treat communications and media markets the same as we do any other markets in a free market capitalist economy. But that's not an answer anybody wants to get to. Well, well and maybe I could just take a slightly different approach on this, too. I mean, you know, I, I believe in government, and so I think that government generally starts from a premise of trying to do what's right and to do something that would be good for consumers. And so in 1992, what they saw was vertical integration between a cable distributor and a programmer. And they said, you know, look, this looks like it could be a real problem, and the, and the interest that they wanted to protect was local broadcasting. And they said, we're going to, local broadcasters use Spectrum, they get it for free. We're going to, we're going to one, treat them in a special manner. Um, you know, because of that, we're going to impose certain obligations on them for public interest obligations, localism, competition, diversity. Um, because we want, we think that this is really important to the democracy of the United States of America. Okay, great. So now, what you've seen over the last 20 years is a huge shift. There's there are big questions I think that need to be asked about whether or not the broadcasters are fulfilling those public interest obligations. Are they different? Are they special? If you ask someone who's under 25 years old, do they recognize that bro a broadcast channel is any different than a cable channel? Um, you know, that's a question that needs to be to be asked and answered. And what has the shift occurred? Because as Adam said, you know, when you when you when you intervene in a market, you put your thumb on the scale. So what are we seeing today? What we're seeing are very large media conglomerates with stables of channels 30, 40, and 50 deep. Um, and then they require the carriage of all of their signals on any distributor. So if you want to get their most favorable, favored program, their most popular programming, you have to carry the rest of it. So if there was a question about a concern about cable vertical integration in 1992, which was pretty, was fairly significant in terms of its number, there has to be a question about what has it caused? What has been the outcome as a result of what the government did in putting its finger on the scale? And should there be another intervention? And what is the intervention? Is the intervention more regulation or is it less regulation? And I think those are the questions that are in front of us in terms of how do we address and move forward into the you know, 21st century, the future of video, which is the question for the panel. So those are the types of things. You know, If broadcasters are special, then they, they should embrace those special requirements as well and not look to be essentially on the on the market side, the commercial side, just like a cable programmer, but then have special benefits on the regulatory side. Um, if they are going to be special, then then maybe they, you know, and if they serve a special purpose uh, in terms of bringing news and information and serving the local community, then then maybe there's a different outcome. But I don't think that we have the answer anymore about whether or not those those self-evident truths back in '92 or or earlier um, in the advent of broadcasting remain so today. Well, you know, I, I think localism is great. I mean, I suppose my question would be whether the current system actually promotes its purported goal of localism. If you have a broadcaster who makes almost all of its money by reselling national content that comes from a network where it's syndicated, and then because of the compulsory license retrans system, it's the exclusive local agent for that content, which is not local, and which they did not produce. I mean, it seems like they don't really have an incentive to produce compelling local content, while as if you said you changed that system, you know, made, and had broadcasters have to pr produce content that people want to watch locally, and that is what they get their money from almost exclusively, I think that might actually promote localism a little more. Just, I'm well, a I'm moderator slash participant. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, I mean, that is the question, right? So if, um, you know, where, where, what, really, where, what's the money for, right? Yeah. So if the, if the networks are providing the most compelling programming to the broadcasters, that's what the retransmission consent fee is essentially going to. That wasn't the goal when Congress enacted it in 1992. The goal was for the signal, not for the content, and it was supposed to go back to the local station. What we're seeing now is 50% or more of the revenue flowing back up to the network. So there's been, you know, an, uh, a, you know, I was say a bastardization or some sort of, you know, what was the purpose of the creating the fee and retransmission consent was for. To, to prop up localism and make sure the local channels did well. And the question is, if, if we're seeing the money flow upstream to the networks and none of the money being reinvested in local programming, there's a real question about whether it's still a workable, viable system that's getting to the outcome that they were hopeful for. Just a brief point on the localism point. Uh, you know, to the extent that policymakers, be they in Congress or the FCC, continue to push localism or their overarching value in this debate, that continues to put a thumb on its scales in its own right. I mean, why do we have things like network non-duplication rules? Why do we have syndicated exclusivity these things? They're rooted in a belief that somehow that promotes localism. And localism has been, been you know, the raison d'etre of broadcasting for a long time. But the reality is, I'm just going to say this, whether it's Bruce and broadcast egos and policymaker egos, 
a lot of the public doesn't demand localism. And we see that with markets that are natural and free, that develop to the tastes and demands of consumers, things that aren't exactly local in character. Now, the reality is, is maybe we still want some local programming. I think we'll still get it, but the reality is we should make everything subservient to it, or else you get rules exactly like the ones we're trying to write. Yeah, that's maybe a, a, a broader point. Uh, I think just my observation would be to question whether we're actually even promoting localism. Like, the rules may have been intended to, but they had the consequence of simply enabling, you know, local businessmen to get rich. Protectionism. National yeah. uh, content. You know, all right, I'm going to go a little broader now and ask Allison this question first, because DISH, you know, as you know, with the automatic commercial skipping hopper, has been something of a disruptive force in the uh, traditional MVP space. So my question is, why is video taking so long to be disrupted in the way that we've seen with uh, other areas of media? You know, we have conferences and panels all the time about the future of books and of music and of journalism, but you know, at the same time, we see that those industries are just transforming before our eyes and it's happening, while well, as uh, with, with cable and with satellite, uh, you have analysts who question whether cord cutting is even happening, or if it's happening, whether it's real, or whether it will really make a difference. So it seems that the, you know, the MVP model, which is cable and satellite and, and Verizon, uh, <laughs> Fios TV, uh, is very, uh, sort of robust, it seems to be a little bit more susceptible, it seems to be a little more permanent almost than uh, other media industries, and why is that, and why hasn't it been disrupted yet in, in the way that we've seen elsewhere? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I guess our observation has been that there are very powerful constituencies who have a vested interest in keeping the structure the way that it is. Um, you know, content providers um, who can negotiate to have you know their channels put in the the lowest the lowest tier or the most widely distributed tier on, on Dish. You know, get paid on a per subscriber basis. That's a really uh, steady, wonderful revenue stream. So I, you know, and uh, the large media companies, you know, have an interest in controlling how their content is distributed. And um, you know, I think as long as these constituencies have the market power that they do, you know, that's going to affect the ability for the video market to you know reinvent itself. Um, I mean, just. You know, one example um, is, you know, Dish created this consumer electronics device, the Hopper, um, and tried to give consumers more choice in terms of which commercials they wanted to watch. And it has, of course, um, the auto hop feature. And we've been sued by all four networks, and they're fighting very, very hard um, to force Dish to take this product away. And when you look at that, it, to us, that just seems sort of counterproductive. Um, our our chair chairman, Charlie Ergen, has said, look, you know, we, we appreciate that advertising is important, but we think advertising is changing, and you know, Dish is more interested in thinking creatively about what we can do to help take advertising, you know, into the 21st century, and think of new ways to distribute content in a way that's good for consumers and good for the industry. So, you know, we try to innovate, uh, at least on the consumer electronics side, but we've been thwarted. Um, so, I guess what I would say is, you know. I think Dish would hope that you know other participants in the industry would sort of join us in thinking about ways to you know, disrupt the industry for the benefit of consumers. But I think it's going to be very hard. Yeah. Now, Rachel, uh, you know, public knowledge—it's no secret we're not really big fans of data caps, and we're very much in favor of net neutrality. And it's part of our thesis that you know, Time Warner Cable—you make your money off of data. You also make your money off of video. And uh, you know, we would question whether uh, brought. If, if disruption has to happen over the top, over broadband connections, yet those broadband connections are primarily controlled by people who also <laughs> control video, you know, whether the incentives are there for the broadband providers to really invest and to you know, adopt policies and billing plans and so on that really enable uh, online video to thrive. So you know, can you just sort of address uh, you know, that, that tension that uh, quite a few people see where, pretend, you know, where maybe data caps are you know, partly designed to prop up uh, cable revenue? Sure, um, and maybe I'll just touch briefly too on the question to Allison. Um, you know, Time Warner Cable hasn't in intervened in say the Aereo case or into the, um, the Dish versus Fox case. But what we are seeing on the copyright side of everything is that there's a lot of confusion about how copyright really works. Um, which makes a lot of companies sit on their hands in terms of innovation. So a lot of it goes to whether you know who's doing the you know the performing or the copying. 
and it, it results in kind of these crazy outcomes where you've got Aereo putting 9,000 antennas out or 10,000 antennas out in order to comply with what they thought was the law um, in the cable vision DVR, remote DVR case. So for, I think from cable, from Time Warner Cable's perspective, we don't, we don't really have a dog in any of these fights. We're certainly watching them carefully, but what we are seeing is certainty which would be, would be a real benefit for us in terms of being able to innovate because there's such a huge draconian um, harm if you cross the line the wrong way in terms of the types of enforcement mechanisms and trouble damages that you might face. That you're, I think that's part of the reason that you yeah. may not see innovation, because um, you've got a lot of folks who are cautious. Um, you know, yeah, publicly you, traded companies, you have to be very careful. And we've definitely seen that in online music, where uncertainty be about copyright laws. Uh, so, I mean, in some ways, we'd like to see the courts decide some of these cases and create certainty one way or the other. Um, um, and then there may be a role for Congress to step in if they think they went, the courts went the wrong direction, like mm -hmm. they did with. Um, fortnightly and teleprompter, and maybe they got it wrong there, but it certainly is congressional prerogative to step in and, and to make some changes. With regard to, um, you know, kind of the, the cable, the thesis of um, cable broadband versus cable video, um, you know, we just don't buy it. I mean, we obviously, as companies, um, you know, the goal is to, to make money. Um, it's to serve your customers. You know, if you look at Time Warner Cable, for instance, we're the second largest cable company, the fourth largest video provider. We have 14 million subscribers. Compare that to you know your your normal um, wireless company that has 80 million or 90 million subscribers. We're really smaller. We're very dedicated to our local markets. We spend billions of dollars. Um, upgrading our facilities. We want our customers to buy as much as possible. So we want to have them buy our video product. We want them to buy our uh, broadband product. We want to have the best broadband product in the market possible depending on consumer demand. Because we're real companies with real um, you know, uh, profits and real boards of directors and real shareholders, we have to be um, responsive to them. So if our consumers say, we need a gigabyte in, you know, in every home today, and there's the application, and, and, and in fact, the, the backside of the internet, the Google servers actually enable that to go that fast. You know, we're going to respond to that. We're going to respond to that consumer pressure because we're the ones, in the, same, in the same way with the video side, part of the problem I think that happens with um, the video product is that it's only the, the, the distributor that has the relationship with the customer. We're the ones that send the bill. We're the ones the customer calls when the signal goes dark or when the bills go up. They never call the broadcaster. They never call the cable programmer. So there's no discipline in the market for the cable programmer to ask for less money or the broadcaster to ask for less money. It's the same on the broadband side. We send the bill to the customer. We've got some customers who only ever surf and watch CNN or you know read CNN articles or only send um, emails with their pictures of their grandchildren. We've got other customers who are online all night gaming and they want faster and higher speeds. So Time Warner Cable's um, uh, approach to the to these types of things is really about consumer choice. So, I mean, I take your point, but I think it is a little more nuanced than that. Where well, it's your incentives a more are not. Than you're saying as well because it does. I mean, there's a glide path to change, right? So, you know, the co cord cutters that are happening today are, are people who, you know, either they're really budget conscious or they're very tech savvy and young. Um, but there are lots of people who really like to have a beautiful, high definition picture on their big screen in their living room. And, and like the fact that cable aggregates it in a way that's very easy to, um, to, uh, you know, to, you know, page through and find your um, channel choice. And and I think you know, in some ways, cable's been denigrated in a way. I think we're incredibly innovative. We've gone from analog systems that were like 400 megahertz to 950 megahertz systems um, that are fully digital and with no consumer disruption. So there's been lots of good things that have, that have happened. And you know, the transition from you know, today's video marketplace, whether you take a package of cable, and we certainly, you know, think you should be able to take whatever you want, whether you want to take it over the broadband pipe or whether you want to take it over the video. Oh. Adam, did you want to uh, touch on any of I did, but I know you're getting the questions. So. Yeah, I, I have some questions here. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, and then I have a final one of my questions. I'm going to ask this. I probably already have the answer to it, but I will ask it as written. If uh, Time Warner Cable and Dish cannot buy ANC or Bravo from two or more suppliers, why should they be allowed to buy network programming from multiple suppliers by eliminating network non-duplication? Anyone? So, you know, if you want to carry MTV, you've got to go to Viacom, right? 
So would this world where we get rid of a lot of the protections that local broadcasters have, where if you're like, well, we want to carry ABC content, we can't get, get a good deal from the local station, no, so we'll just go to Baltimore. And it's like, well, it's the same content. You don't really normally have that. You normally have one content producer who controls the content, and you've got to deal with them. So you know, are you proposing this regime where you can bid multiple suppliers of the same exact content against each other? or? Look, I mean, this is something that there's many different layers to the contractual negotiating process over content. This is something that networks and stations and distributors all have to work out amongst themselves. We've again seen this work out in other, in other contexts. What I was going to do, John, is challenge your assertion that there hasn't been a lot of disruption in this field. I think there's been an incredible amount of disruption. And you see, I mean, I was reading Gigi's uh, testimony, Gigi Stone's uh, testimony on the way over here when she talks about there's widespread agreement that we're currently living in the golden age of television. And she cites Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, Modern Family, Daily Show, Colbert Report. Think about that. Of those six, seven things she mentions, only one of them was on broadcast television. That's a pretty big form of disruption itself. Number two, I watched four of those, every season of four of those, on my Xbox 360. <laughs> I mean, 25 years ago, if you would have told somebody, I'm going to watch an entire season of television on a video game console, they would have said, what the hell's a video game console? And then they would have said, you know, well, how are you going to do that? That's what we do today. Huge disruption. How do those contracts work? I mean, there were people competing off of each other all the time for whether it's going to be on a video game console or on Hulu or on Netflix or on television. We just announced we're going to make Time Warner Cable available on Roku, so you can, you know, get everything through Roku. Um, so I think that you're, take your point, there's so much going on, and it's really interesting stuff, and that's why, you know, there needs to be a debate, but you also be very careful about unintended consequences. Well, you know, and specifically to respond to this question, I mean, there doesn't need to be a rule promoting uh, exclusivity. You can just have private contra private parties. You can have ABC, the network, tell its local stations exactly. that they're not allowed to sell on other. I, I, it's beyond me why there needs to be an actual FCC rule to sort of in strengthening what would probably already be uh, privately contracted yeah, for. Right. In terms of disruption, I think I'm talking more about business models than the devices on which you watch content or cable, which has been around for, for some time. And actually, I think this will be my final question for everyone because we're running out of time and we're going to get kicked out of here at 3 o'clock sharp, so I've got to, okay. I've got, I've got, I want to get to it. Um, so, you know, people have been talking about this or that tech company, Flavor of the Month, potentially entering the video market. Uh, you know, it was Apple for a while and now all of a sudden it's Intel. Now, from the perspective of, you know, the economics of an established MVPD, you know, not specifically about Intel, but what challenges would a, such a tech company face if they wanted to, you know, essentially duplicate MVPD service online. Um, well, it's it's definitely a big challenge, um, and you know I think Dish tends to welcome disruption and welcome more competition. Um, when Comcast and NBC were going through their FCC merger process, one of the, the questions we raised was, you know, particularly at that time, online video was sort of, um, kind of an emerging service, more of a, a maverick, if you will. And one of the concerns that we raised was, you know, if you let Comcast and NBC consolidate all of this content um, under, you know, the largest pay TV distributor, um, you know, what does that mean for the next video entrant? Will they be able to get the content rights necessary to offer a really compelling uh, substitute for cable or satellite TV service? So, um, you know, I think that that's this is one of the times where I think the government can play an important role in trying to encourage and foster competition and innovation to say, you know, if there's a big you know, media transaction, what does that mean um, for the future of video? So um, I, think there are, I think there are challenges, you know, as the, the industry consolidates that could make it harder for an Apple or an Intel to enter the market. Um, and I do think that, you know, we should be mindful, the government should be mindful, the industry should be mindful about you know, whether there, there are safeguards such as merger conditions that can help foster those markets. Right, I mean, if you're an online video company, you have problems with access to content and then problems with access to consumers. We disagree on the access to consumers part, that's net neutrality, that's data caps. But even putting that to the side, you still have the access to content issues. And those, in some ways, are probably more of a challenge for you know, a tech company. So. Uh, Rachel, what are your thoughts on you know content issues for an online distributor? 
Well, I mean, I think it, you know, I think it is difficult. Um, it really comes down to money and what the cost is going to be, and that's really not the distributor's world, right? So, I mean, if you look at a dish or a Time Warner cable or most of the market, I mean, the only really strongly vertically integrated company left, because everybody else has gone the opposite direction, is Comcast NBCU. There's some limited vertical integration, um, but but not much, and. Um, it really goes to the to the content companies. Um, how do they want their content sold? They sit in the catbird seat with all of us, no matter you know to some degree how big we are. Um, so if the content companies don't think they're going to get enough from Intel or Apple or whoever, then they're not going to sell their content to them. And it has little to do with whether or not Dish has anything to say about it or Time Warner Cable has anything to say about it. So the, the question is, um, you know, how do the programmers and the content holders want this market to evolve? Where are they making the bulk of their money? You know, what is a Google or an Apple or a, a Netflix or a, um, what did you say, Intel? Uh, what are they willing to pay um, in order to, you know, kind of sustain the programmer's business model? All right, let's try to finish this off in one minute. I would just say, <laughs> on that, you know, if you're a programmer, it's very hard for you to start selling online if Comcast tells you not to when they're your biggest buyer. And one of the distortions of the marketplace today is that Comcast can't tell an independent programmer, don't sell to Time Warner Cable, don't sell to Dish. You know, we have actual FCC policies in place, some of them have sunset, that prevent that. There is no such protection for online video. And that is, whether or not you think those policies are good, it is certainly unequal, and that is a challenge that online video John, faces. what you're making is a antitrust case. If you want to make that case, go make it. We don't need affirmative regulation to deal with this stuff. Like I said, contracts, copyright, antitrust can handle 99% of the problems we're discussing here today that are currently encumbered by these crazy rules that do nothing more than protect certain interests. What's that 1% that's not covered that's a real problem? It's sports programming. We didn't even talk about that. That's a whole other juggernaut, right? I mean, that we could have a whole panel on that. Yeah. That's next year. But, uh, you know, I would say you exclude sports from all of these other discussions because it's such a unique type of content programming. Everything else can be handled by those three things I mentioned. Contract, copyright, and it. Yeah, and I think, by the way, to finish off, I think that NFL could probably destroy cable if they just decided to go over the top <laughs> and sell directly to consumers, but that's probably not going to happen. All right. Uh, we have reading buzz, but that is not related to us. But if everyone wants to grab um, those of us who were, uh, remember uh, uh, Representative Pickering's career uh, will know that um, he you know, worked initially um, as a staffer for Senator Trent Lott, um, heavily involved in shaping the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Uh, he represented uh, a, uh, uh, a district uh, that had, uh, uh, for a very long time, one of the you know, most important competitors uh, in uh, telecommunications. Uh, his expertise uh, in the area of, uh, uh, of telecommunications uh, was not only you know, uh, what made him a leader on these issues, uh, in the House, but also uh, his uh, genuine commitment to trying to reach uh, bipartisan uh, uh, solutions um, to what was a uh, very difficult uh, transition for the telecommunications system. Uh, it is fashionable now to talk about how uh, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 is outdated uh, and uh, all of these things that we could have done uh, uh, differently now that we are uh, more than 15 years later, but uh, we need to uh, remember that uh, there were a lot of very important uh, experiments and a lot of successes in the 1996 Act, uh, and uh, Representative Pickering was uh, critical uh, in shaping those, uh, in uh, working with the um, uh, not nearly with the uh, Republican uh, majority, but reaching out to uh, uh, to Democrats as well. Uh, and as we face uh, what is now uh, the critical uh, transition uh, of uh, not merely uh, the traditional voice network, but uh, of all of our communications networks as the long-discussed convergence of IP networks uh, and other modes of communication network is finally here. Um, it is, uh, I think, uh, uh, enormously uh, helpful uh, for all of us uh, to hear uh, from somebody who is uh, um, expert 
uh, in this uh, from uh, experience, expert in this from a technical uh, perspective, uh, and expert in this from uh, the uh, pragmatic political perspective uh, in the best possible use of pragmatic and political of actually getting necessary things done. Uh, so with that, let me introduce the Honorable Chip Pickering. Thank you very much. Carol, thank you, and public knowledge, I, I want to express my appreciation for the invitation to join you today uh, and to talk about something that is, that is very important uh, to our uh, future economy, and, and I want to talk in a little bit of what is at stake, why it matters, and put it in as much context uh, as I can. I've uh, titled my, uh, my talk today, Too Big, Will Fail. Not T-O-O, -O, but T-W-O. Too big, will fail. And I want to uh, speak as a free market Adam Smith conservative Republican who believes in competition and believes that functioning free competitive markets expands individual and consumer freedom, political freedom, and creates the most pro prosperous country. And I want to go into why I believe that, and to a certain degree, the history of what shaped and formed uh, the beliefs, but what uh, I hope is more important is really the facts of history. Uh, so what I, I, I briefly want to do is, is give short personal history and then I go into what I believe are the relevant things in telecommunications history and the lessons <coughs> that we can draw uh, from those. As I graduated from Ole Miss, I, I ended up going to Budapest, Hungary, which at that time, 1986-1987, was part of the old Soviet bond. And then I, I returned home and went to Baylor University in Texas, um, so Mississippi to Texas and Eastern Europe. There's a lot of similarities uh, there. But I ended up uh, doing an MBA program with an emphasis in international management. And while I was there, I got to be a graduate assistant of a professor whose specialty was comparative economics, specifically looking at the Soviet centrally planned non-market economy and contrasting that to free market economic policy and principles. Then I came to Washington in the first Bush administration and I worked at the Department of Agriculture and as the, the Soviet Union collapsed and the, the Soviet bloc began to reform politically and economically, Congress passed an act called the Support for East European Democracy Act. And our objective as an administration and as a country during that transition from Soviet non-market, non-democratic systems, were, uh, the objective was to help in that transition to move them to free market economics and free political democratic systems. And so as uh, I worked there for two years, and then I, I joined Cerner Lock staff in 1991. And my first responsibility, my first assignment in 1991, as a young Senate staffer, <coughs> excuse me, was to help uh, bring about a free market, a more free market policy in, in energy. We were working on the 1992 Energy Act, and as you all know, a monopoly a model, non-market, economic policy in the United States. Much of uh, our large sectors of our economy were not free market. Even uh, in the, the land where we think free market economics rules. So we had a non-market, poor economic sector, and we were trying to bring wholesale competition and wholesale free market policy to the energy sector. As I finished that work, I went to, to uh, I began to work on behalf of Senator Lott and on his staff on the tele what became the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And it took us four long years to get there. And again, natural monopoly policy, non-free market, non-market policy. How do we transition to free functioning competitive telecommunication uh, markets? And so that early experience, those early experiences uh, have shaped, you know, my, my views, my values, and the perspective of what works, what, what doesn't, and why free market competition is so critical to the success as a nation. 
And what happens when a nation adopts those policies? Sustains them, promotes them, and protects them. And so as we talk today, it's in that, that uh, early formative experiences that, that, uh, that I call on. You know, at the same time as uh, I was working on uh, the Telecommunications Act in 1995, as we got into the Senate, uh, the congressman that represented my district retired, you know, Sonny Montgomery, and I uh, entered the race in the fall of 1995, before the final passage of the 96 Act, but to, to run for Congress. And I, I like to say um, affectionately and jokingly that I went from being a Senate staffer to running for Congress, becoming a member of Congress, and losing all my power and influence from when I'd been on the uh, But what I, uh, as I, I became a member of Congress, one of the great uh, privileges is to give tours through the Capitol, and I would often take school groups. And as I was giving them a tour, I would uh, talk to them about you know, different things that define us as a people, as a country, and our history. And I would use uh, five flags that either by congressional action or by presidential action fly 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They never come down. And they're in places that are the defining moments in American history. And they define something specific and special about the American character. And, uh, and uh, as you're thinking, okay, what are the five flags? Where are the five flags? I, I would always ask the, the, the class and the the students and my sons, can you name the five flags that fly 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Now the first flag is at Fort McHenry. So 1812, a new entrant on the world stage is challenged by the powerful incumbent. And the question was, would we survive? Would our flag come down? Would this commitment to freedom and democracy continue? Well, we defined ourselves at that, that very early stage in our history is that nobody's going to make us back down, no one can make us quit, and we're not going to, to give in. And then if you look at the other uh, defining uh, moments in those flags, one's not even on this earth, it's on the moon, defining our spirit of exploration, discovery, experimentation, the quest for, for learning, the quest uh, for knowledge that always kind of pioneer exploration, discovery, character of our, our nation. The next flag is, uh, is a little bit different, and that is at Pearl Harbor. So not only would we defend in 1812 our own freedom, but at Pearl Harbor it's the flag that defines that as a nation we would defend the rights and the freedoms of the rest of the world, and that we would help maintain free people anywhere that struggle occurs. Not always, not consistently, but it is a defining, proud moment of American uh, history. Now the, the fourth flag is, is near and dear to all of our hearts. It's here in the Capitol. It flies over the Capitol, the, the, the flag of democracy and political freedom, and it never comes down. Now the fifth flag is at the tomb of the unknown soldier. So the flag of sacrifice to maintain the beliefs and freedoms and what we hold dear. So those are the five flags. If you were to look at telecom history, and, and I've, I've given this talk and, and made this point, I really believe that there are three defining, you could, you could take issue with the three defining moments, but I believe that there are three great acts in our lifetime that have had more economic impact, expanded more freedom, created more wealth, more investment, more innovation, more jobs, more political freedom than any other three actions in domestic policy of any other three in our lifetime. Now that goes back for me 50 years. Most people would not name these three. Most classes would not name these three. Most people in this room might not have thought of these three. But I would, I would propose that the breakup of AT&T in 1984, and what happened after that? We would have copper networks, and we'd have the old system, but we wouldn't have had the, the, the great expansion economically and technologically of what we've known the last 30 years. 
second great accident. 1993, two World War II generation members of the Senate, uh, some of the oldest members of the Senate, did something unexpected that changed what I, I believe is economic history as well. They stopped a duopoly policy in wireless and they adopted a competitive auction where they said, no longer are we going to have just two in a market, again, too big to fail. We are going to have a fully competitive wireless industry where you have seven per market. We will competitively bid and have free market auctions to determine the values and then the deployments that will come from intense competition. That was 1993, first auction in 1994. We're 19 years later, and look at what the world is in the wireless networks and all of the applications and the devices and what has happened in the mobile world. It's changed our economy, changed the way we live and work. It had a dramatic effect, and the investment came and was driven by competition just as the fiber infrastructure the wireless infrastructure and the fiber infrastructure and backbones of our nation came when we did what? We adopted competitive policy. The third great act is when we adopted in 1996 a fully competitive free market approach instead of a monopoly based policy in all sectors of telecommunications. The most significant thing that we did is to remove all barriers to competition. Anyone could enter in any sector, and anyone could compete. But the second linchpin of the 96 Act, and very, very significant part of the 1996 Act, was the establishment of a competitive interconnection policy. So that if you were a wireless network, you could connect to a wireline network at a fair, at a fair cost. Dramatically drove down prices to the access of the network and equally as important as the competitive auction, the access to the network, the interconnection policy there, then the interconnection policy on the wireline side that allowed competition and investment and innovation to occur in all sectors. Those two things combined in the 1996 Act made a tremendous uh, difference. So those three great acts created more wealth, more innovation, more investment, more jobs than any other three economic policy issues in our lifetime. Y'all can, we can debate that, we can discuss it, but tax policy kind of ebbs and flows. Budgets and deficits and surpluses rise and fall. Health care we struggle with. Energy is half, kind of a half solution of competition and free markets and monopoly policy. The telecom policy that drove our economy because of competition and the introduction of competition and competitive free market forces made more difference economically, in my view, than anything else that we've done in the last 30 to 40 years. And could you imagine if we had stayed with the monopoly and duopoly policy that we would have enjoyed the economic growth, expansion, innovation, and the the quality of life and the way of life that we have today. And it's not possible, in my view, to imagine a monopoly or duopoly policy achieving all that we have through, and you know, what we have seen through competitive policy. Now that brings us to our question uh, today posed by AT&T. We're going to a new technology, IP. We're going from TDM to a packet mode, switched uh, electronics, overlaying the, the network that we affectionately call the PST network. And should we, as AT&T proposes, end competitive policy and end interconnection as we go to a new technology? Now to the first question, let me... I kind of feel like uh, Marco Rubio. <laughs> that, that uh, should we transition to an IP-based network? And the clear, obvious answer 
is yes. The second question, should we end competitive policy and end interconnection as we move to a new technology? And in my view, the clear answer to that is no. And I want to get into that. And why I believe maintaining competitive policy uh, is so important for the future growth and the future benefits of what we have uh, in the nation. But before I, I get into that, there's some things that I would like to try to establish as common facts or common findings or a common framework. One, competition works. Two, monopoly or duopoly does not work. I believe that economic history, if AT&T wants to have an experiment or a field trial with ending interconnection and in some markets ending competition, I think that the field trial has occurred over the last three decades. And the evidence is so overwhelmingly clear that competitive policy and interconnection are creating greater uh, markets and interconnected networks that the evidence is clear that competition works and it's preferable to having a disconnected policy and in some markets a fallback to a monopoly or a duopoly. So one, competition works. Two, interconnection is the cornerstone of competition. And why is that? And what are the, the examples that we have of interconnection and their interconnection policy? We have interconnection policy in transportation, in our highways and interstates and local roads. We have interconnection policy in trade, our ports and our airports and other nations. We increase the market when we increase the networks of, of trade. We have interconnection in, in electricity and in grids and in independent production so that, that anybody can connect into a grid and compete for the best price of, of the power. We have interconnection in our pipelines. We have uh, interconnection in telecommunications. And what we have learned through the information age and through the internet age is that interconnected networks create the largest possible market the largest creation of wealth, the most innovation, and the most jobs. So to end it, I think would be shrinking the market, reducing investment, blocking the new entrant, limiting the entrepreneur, and having a, a negative effect on the growth of our nation. And why would we want to do that? We've had three decades of success of this policy, why would we want to go back to the past policies promoting, favoring, and in many cases subsidizing an incumbent against the new entrant or the entrepreneur? Third, what is a functioning free market? And many people can debate this. And we have non-functioning, non-market policy that protects incumbents and subsidizes and that is not a free, functioning market. So as a Republican, we need to, to say that we are going to be the party of competition, whether it is in the public sector or in the private sector, and reject uh, the old uh, views of concentration is preferable to competition. Now, um, the big part of this debate is, is really about who controls the future. What is past, what is future. Now, technologies come and go. We have copper, we have fiber, we have analog, we have digital, we have TDM, we'll have packet mode. Technologies come and go. But what is the future will always be driven by whether you, the free market forces of competition and functioning markets drive the innovation, drive the investment. So our objective should not be to achieve some technology. The objective should be to maintain free, functioning, competitive markets. So that's the framework. Now, as we look at... Um, as we, as we look at the transition that is before us in, in telecommunications policy and the telephone market, what are the principles 
that we're going to favor free market uh, functioning competitive policy. That we're going to have a, a policy that promotes at least four to a market. And why does that work? And do we have recent evidence to support that? When AT&T proposed to acquire T-Mobile and taking four national <coughs> carriers down to three and continuing with a period of concentration, I believe that the FCC and the Justice Department rightly stopped that merger. And look at, and look at what is happening and, and look at the result today. One, SoftBank has invested more into the U.S. economy and has partnered with Sprint. They entered, invested, and they're building a 4G network. T-Mobile is strengthening. They're partnering. They're yeah, FCC the adopted, and the, the courts have sustained data roaming. And that allows, whether it's a new entrant or a regional company <coughs> or all the other competitors in the market, to exchange traffic, to interconnect. They can do it on commercially negotiated, but there's a backstop that there's going to be interconnection on the wireless side and that achieves a functioning seamless competitive market all of those things are, are creating a market that is stronger and healthier today on the wireless side why would we want to reject that on the wireline side and inter and and end interconnection policy i think the clear answer both historically and recently is that competitive uh, policy, competitive interconnection policy, is the most meaningful, meaningful way, the most minimal way, with the lightest touch possible, to maintain functioning markets. And as a Republican, I hope that we reject concentration, embrace competition, that we reject Ann Rand, and reaffirm Adam Smith, that we reject the incumbent-based policies that protect and subsidize, and return to encouraging, promoting, and incentivizing the new entrants, the entrepreneur, the small business, the mid-sized business, and the, the competitive markets that help those who are in that space. If we do that, the outcome will be the same that we've had for the last three decades. We know what the outcome has been. The evidence is clear. The experiment has been enduring. And it has always increased our economic growth, productivity, efficiency, our jobs, but more importantly, and this is, as all Americans, it's increased individual freedom. It's increased the consumer's freedom. It's increased the economic well-being. It's increased all the things that we care about in, in almost every case, a positive way. So if we're going to plant a flag that defines a part of the American character very uniquely and distinctly, a very important part of the American character is competition because it drives the best whether you're an incumbent or a new entrant. It makes us better as a people. It always delivers a better future. And so we should plant this flag of competition and protect it and promote it as we go forward. Any questions? So thanks very much. We're uh, once again going to be uh, passing out our uh, uh, index cards and uh, collecting them from those who have uh, uh, filled them out. Um, uh, while we're doing that, let me ask you uh, uh, one quick question, uh, which is, uh, um, so competition is obviously very important, but uh, there were many things, as was recognized in the 1996 Act, uh, that competition uh, won't provide. So we had, for example, the Universal Service Statute, uh, which was uh, part of the uh, uh, of the 1996 Act because we wanted to make sure that everybody in the United States would have access to uh, to phone service. We have consumer protection uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, Telecommunications Act. Um, we at the Public Knowledge have put out our our five fundamentals 
uh, framework which talks about competition as one of the important fundamental principles um, of uh, the transition, but also uh, lists four other uh, important uh, uh, principles as well. I wonder if you might uh, uh, perhaps uh, speak to, is competition enough that if we had competition uh, that would uh, take care of uh, uh, the rest of these concerns, or do we have uh, uh, in addition to, even if competition's the, the, the major support in the tent pole, are there other issues that we need to be yeah, concerned about as well? You know, you know, my uh, view is, as, uh, as we look at the, un the principle, and, it, and this was a very important part of the 96 Act, was to have universal access to telecommunication services, which was maintaining, preserving a principle that goes back to the adoption of the 1934 monopoly policy. I believe competition much more efficiently achieves the universal objectives and free market forces and, te and new technologies much more efficiently achieves the objective of, of universal access uh, and coverage on, on telecommunications. We have had USF reform uh, in, the, in the past and I think uh, for the most part uh, that is going in the, the right direction. New technologies are, in a state like mine, Mississippi, which is very rural. Uh, the, the interesting thing is, Mississippi and Arkansas, when you think of those two states, you probably think they're in the bottom half in just about every category. But there are, there's one category where Mississippi and Arkansas are number one and two in the country. Y'all know what, those, what that would be? It is the penetration of wireless broadband in Mississippi and Arkansas. And the reason is that you had Altel, a regional carrier, and you had Cellular uh, South, now Ceasefire. And they built out their, their markets from the rural to the urban. And they're two examples of where competition, and where you don't have that competition, you don't have the same level of deployment and investment by all providers. Those regional carriers made the incumbents invest in their networks. There's much more competition where you do have multiple players and it covers everyone. Competition, I think, is the, the centerpiece and much more effectively achieves the universal goal. All right, well, let me, let me now take um, uh, some uh, of the, uh, the questions uh, here uh, from uh, the audience. Uh, I have one uh, here that comes up a lot. Um, uh, both uh, the AT&T breakup uh, and the AT&T T-Mobile deal rejection were antitrust and not regulatory. Uh, why do we need regulation when antitrust uh, is there to take care of the competition issues? Could you re repeat the first part of that? So if both the AT&T breakup was done as, a, as an antitrust case and the AT&T T-Mobile yes. rejection which was uh, pivotal in, in uh, bringing back investment uh, to the market, you, uh, you told us, uh, was also an antitrust case. So uh, is antitrust uh, going to be enough here? Can we uh, say get rid of all of the, uh, the FCC uh, uh, regulations and just rely on antitrust uh, to provide the necessary competition? Um, yeah, I would, uh, I would say one, that they were, those are two cases that were both decided on antitrust basis and that they were correct cases. But like a physician who would prefer to have pre uh, preventive medicine versus after the fact, uh, much more costly, much more disruptive uh, treatment, you know, a minimal competitive rule that opens markets and allows for functioning competitive uh, options and opportunities is interconnection. And if you maintain that in a smart, strategic, restrained way, some markets is, is, is applicable that there's an obligation. Some markets it's not. Some markets are competitive and there's willing buyers and sellers and we need to look at it market by market. But wherever we can, either by the 96 Act and sustaining and promoting that and carrying it through all of the different generations of technology, uh, we should because it would it would prevent us from taking an antitrust action, which will always be more disruptive to the economy and to the businesses. And it is a minimal way 
to maximize the objectives that we have as a country, and that is around investment, innovation, jobs, consumer benefits, and the individual benefits. So just to, uh, I guess, uh, play on that for a second. So when we look at, say, the breakup of AT&T in 1984, and then the passage of the Telecommunications Act in 1996, how would you compare the disruption uh, as opposed to, say, the benefit? Do you think that, for example, the 1996 Act was a smoother uh, transition? Was it more disruptive than the AT&T breakup, or uh, um, was the uh, uh, was the AT&T breakup really kind of the, the the thing that did it, and then the 1996 Act was just sort of an add-on? Well, the, the, uh, without the 1984 uh, antitrust action, we would not have had the 1996 Act. But this is where I believe the 96 Act is preferable and superior to antitrust, and that we created a framework that is flexible over time. It has forbearance, it has uh, ways to look at markets that whether they're functioning or not functioning, and to adapt and adjust over time. Antitrust uh, it does not have that uh, flexibility. You come in and the, and the remedies are usually, and the cases are long and costly, and the remedies are, are disruptive, where if you have a predictable and certain framework that says, one, we're going to promote universal access, we're going to promote competition and free markets and functioning markets, and we have these objectives and everyone knows what they are, everyone knows the rules of the road, and that it can adjust with new technologies and adapt, then I think that that's a good example of public policy, and this is, um, and I didn't get to say this in, in, in my talks, and I, uh, in my talk, and I, and I meant to. We need to reestablish the bipartisan consensus around competitive telecommunications policy that existed for three decades. We had a bipartisan commitment that we're going to reject monopoly policy, and we're going to promote competitive free market policy. Now, it's not perfect. But that's been the objective. And it was supported by Republicans, Democrats, Republican presidents, Democratic presidents. It was Reagan's Justice Department that brought, wrote the AT&T. It was Republican Congress that did the 96 Act, signed by Democratic President Bill Clinton. And it was across the board. You had a bipartisan, vast majority committed to competitive policy. And we need to reestablish and re restore the bipartisan compact and consensus around competitive policy. How does the uh, uh, elimination of the PSTN or the transition of the PSTN deal with 911 uh, services? Yeah, that's one of the things that the FCC and many of the comments, if you look at the comments that have been filed in response to the at and uh, petition, is how do you do that? And we've done that successfully, and I had the good fortune when I was in Congress to work, as if you have a VoIP provider, or IP-based uh, service, how do you maintain emergency services and first responders and 911? Uh, so I think that that can be dealt with in the transition appropriately. The other thing that we need to, to realize, and as someone from Mississippi and who lived through Katrina, the great thing about competitive policy versus monopoly or duopoly policy is that you have multiple networks. What do multiple networks give you when they're interconnected and when they're interoperable? It gives you redundancy. And so whether it's Sandy or Katrina, the greater uh, competition creates greater networks, which create more reliable networks, more redundant networks, but you have to have the linchpin of competition and public safety what is that linchpin? Interconnection, interoperability. Uh, I don't know if we have any other uh, um, questions uh, from the floor, but um, let me ask, uh, I think, one more question. We're seeing now uh, a lot of action uh, in the states uh, where uh, you have a lot of state legislators that are uh, um, saying we should just eliminate regulation of the uh, uh, of all IP services and IP-based services. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, some people say that the FCC should not uh, act until uh, Congress acts. Uh, how do you see the relationship between uh, you know, the uh, uh, Congress 
um, the Federal Communications Commission, and then, uh, of course, the uh, uh, the states uh, and and all of the, and their role in this uh, transition process. Well, it is um, both in the pre '96, post '96. There's always been a a partnership of implementing whichever policy the the federal government has adopted. In my view, uh, the natural monopoly policy was a, a great mistake and it created a great regulatory uh, regime around monopoly policy prior to 1996. After 1996, then there was a great partnership, I think in the right direction, which was to promote competition. And so as we go through the transition, we need to find the minimal way to maintain functioning free competitive markets. Uh, and it needs to be done in some form of partnership between the states and the federal government and how those agreements and how those terms and conditions are, are, uh, are realized. And so that uh, the, the state-federal partnership will always continue and it's, it's hard to see how that could end uh, on, on telecommunication services. Yeah, I guess um, uh, this is the last question and I'm, I'm uh, unfortunately I'm trying to um, uh, whoever uh, uh, gave this to us I'm, I'm uh, trying to, to find a way to, to frame this here but uh, uh, we talk about this as about the telephone network and the voice network but this is really uh, a multi-sector uh, lens that we're uh, looking at here everything uh, is moving to IP and, and these physical networks, whether they're wireless or, or wireline networks, are, are now supporting a large number of, of different uh, services. Um, looking at the PSTN transition, um, what other sectors do you think are really sort of caught up in all of this? Um, how do we uh, um, you know, uh, make sure that uh, uh, these different uh, uh, sectors of the uh, economy that we've traditionally thought of as being very different uh, are sustained and, and hopefully expanded um, by the uh, transition of what we think of as the telephone network to being the IP, uh, the all IP network. Yeah, you know, we, we want to see AT&T modernize their network. Uh, to go from you know, a copper to an IP network. Most of the competitors, or almost all the competitors, are already IP. And most of their networks, you know, the long haul, the long distance, the, the middle mile, the, the rings, uh, much of the direct access, uh, dedicated facilities, those are IP fiber based. If you look at uh, what the competitors have done, uh, they always, incumbents do many things well, they don't innovate very well. The competitors brought voice over internet, DSL, they're bringing ethernet, cloud-based uh, services. And so we, we want you know, everyone to be able to, to transition and, and compete on that and to, and to facilitate that. Uh, I think that there are limited things you can do that, that currently exist if you just extend them uh, into the IP world, that again, it's not technology, we should be technologically neutral. One of the principles of the act, core principles of the act, we should be competitively neutral. Those types of, of things have helped us, in, in most cases, not all cases, uh, get the answer right as we make these different transitions. Uh, but I, I, I do think that, that we're seeing emerging areas of our economy without regulation function very well and have competitive choice. We need to be wise and discreet of choosing where we have non-functioning or the possibility of a bottleneck that would prevent competition and be targeted, strategic and smart of only addressing those areas where you could possibly have a failed or non-functioning or non-competitive uh, market. And I, I think the, the incentives uh, are in place for us to get to a transition without sacrificing competition or the targeted interconnection that works. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is, uh, a, a, a 
only the very beginning of uh, the discussions uh, around this, I'm sure, which will cause some groans for people who've been having these discussions for the last several years, but now they're hopefully kicking into high speed. So uh, thank you for uh, sharing uh, your thoughts with us, and uh, um, I'd like to ask uh, 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 the next uh, panel to uh, come forward, please. Uh, and is one of the most uh, provocative uh, speakers, particularly from the libertarian perspective on copyright reform. Uh, next to Tom is the person I call the uh, mother of copyright reform advocacy, and that's Pam Samuelson, who really doesn't really need an introduction. Uh, but were it not for Pam, I'm not sure public knowledge would be here. I'm not sure, I know the clinics uh, that are training young folks to be uh, copyright advocates would not be around. Uh, she really kind of started it all and she's continuing uh, continuing her advocacy in big and little ways, both through her, uh, her law reviews, her writings. She is a professor at, uh, at, at uh, Bolt Hall, which is the Berkeley Law School, for those of you who don't know. Uh, but also she was really critical in bringing academic authors together to fight um, uh, the Google Book Settlement, which many of us, including public knowledge, thought was anti-competitive. And I believe the judge mentioned uh, the authors prominently in his decision to strike down that settlement. Uh, and then uh, lastly, Mike McGeary from Engine Advocacy, which is one of the newest and most powerful entrants into the, uh, the Washington Advocacy game representing small entrepreneurs and startups. And they have a, if you didn't know, they have an event tomorrow. Uh, so uh, it's all yeah, about, it's that, and tonight, that's right, that's tonight at, at Ping Pong Dim Sum at the very late hour for old people like me at 8 o'clock uh, at Ping Pong Dim Sum in, uh, in Penn Quarter. So I will be there despite my age uh, and the fact that I have children, I will be there. So let me start first with Pam, and this is a question that's going to go to everybody, a very broad question, and I'd like you to answer this question in, in uh, three to five minutes. Why do we need copyright reform in the U.S.? Isn't everything just peachy? <laughs> so we'll start with Pam and then we'll go to Tom. So one reason I think uh, we need copyright reform is because the statute uh, that we have today uh, is largely the product of a 1950s mindset. So there were a series of studies done in the 1950s about what kinds of reform the 1909 Act needed. Um, uh, and in the early 1960s, most of those ideas got manifested in a, a statute which only got enacted in 1976, but actually was pretty close to the statute at the time. And of course, at the time, nobody thought that copyright really was going to uh, regulate the daily behavior of everybody. It was only this sort of like real small sector of people who uh, were like uh, broadcasters or, or cable companies or uh, publishers. Uh, and so they're the people who showed up and they crafted the rules uh, that, uh, that were meant for them. But nobody imagined the internet. No one imagined the set of questions that we've been facing. And the statute's a little rigid in certain ways. And something like the reproduction right was not thought of in terms of in, in digital form, everything's a reproduction. And therefore, this, this thing that's supposed to be an important exclusive right now kind of gets broken because it applies too broadly. So those are just a few ideas uh, about uh, why we need copyright reform. I could go on, but I know other people have to use too. Tom, do you want your uh, slides up? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I put together some graphics to help you uh, understand in a visual way why I think copyright reform is necessary. I should start out with a trademark issue though, by the way, because I see my friend Jerry, uh, Jerry Brito is here and I'm actually listed here as the author of Copyright and Balance. He edited that collection. I just wrote one paper in there. So I just want to set that straight. I'm going to have a book out on copyright. It's called Intellectual Privilege. Uh, can we go to the first slide? I just want to show you quickly. This is a news clip. How do we know co we need copyright reform? People talk about copyright being in a delicate balance. I think that is wrong. We cannot put copyright in a delicate balance because we don't have the numbers. All we can look for is salient injustices. This young lady, it's just one story of many. This young lady got thrown in jail for three days because she whipped out her camera at a movie and happened to sort of accidentally, maybe a little more than accidentally, but she got like three or four seconds of film 
of one of these uh, werewolf movie stars taking off his shirt so she could share it with a friend. Sent to jail for three days. She faced jail time of many years and considerable fines. She got off the hook, but I think that's evidence that things are crazy out of whack. I don't know that we can say copyright is delicately balanced, but I think we can say it's indelicately imbalanced. Can we see the next slide? This is the copyright term in the United States. Kind of the, 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 there's different ways to calculate copyright term. It's kind of your basic term. Since the 1790 Act, Pam mentioned some of these other acts that have come along, you can see every time they increase the copyright term. Every time. And you'll notice some of the shapes of those colors are kind of funny. They're L-shaped. Why? Because there are retroactive extensions of the copyright term. Can we go one more slide? How do we explain this? Well, here's the indelicate bit. That line there shows the copyright term of Steamboat Willie. Now, it so happens, I think Steamboat Willie is in the public domain. Check out my book. I talk about this at length. I'm not the first person to discover this, although I don't think enough publicity has been given to the to me fact that Steamboat Willie is not copyright protected. They didn't satisfy the formalities, the stringent formalities of the 1909 Act. But Disney treats it like it's copyrighted. And look here what happened. Steamboat Willie came out in 1928. So okay, initially it got this maximum 56 year term. And then it started running down. So when that dotted line hits the x-axis, time's up for Steamboat Willie. But it never gets there. It gets close and lawmakers up the term. And it gets close again, and they up the term again. Now, I don't know that Disney's lobbyists are prowling these halls. Maybe you do. I'm sure you could tell me stories. Maybe it's just a coincidence. But I think we know the dynamic at work here. We have diffuse costs and concentrated benefits. And that, my friends, is a recipe for a public choice disaster. It's setting out a timeout at 2023. Your guess is better than mine as to whether or not it'll get extended again, but the public choice dynamic suggests that it'll happen again in less reform copyright, and it's just going to get more and more indelicately imbalanced. Thank you. Wait, why don't we uh, go to Eric? Why do we need copyright reform? Sure. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that, that we uh, as Reddit think about doing ourselves or things that we just see in the sort of online ecosystem, especially around communities where there's a real opportunity for innovation. Um, and, and, you know, we it's a pretty amazing uh, place that we're in. I mean, Reddit is a company of, I think, uh, now 22 people. And we have a, a site that's in the top 150 in the world. And whether you like Reddit or not, it's pretty amazing that, uh, you know, a site run by that few uh, amount of people and run by that little amount of money can, can reach such a broad amount of people. But there's all kinds of other places where something like Reddit um, or, or Reddit itself could get into and where uh, innovation could happen, but we're, we're sort of hamstrung by this, this you know, sort of analog copyright mindset and, and legacy and, and by, you know, constant uh, uh, harassment and constant sort of abuse of some of the existing copyright laws. Mike? Um, in, in a lot of the same way that I think Eric's framing this, what we look at with Engine is not even so much the companies that are out there right now, the kind of, you know, we can talk about user-generated content, some of these, you know, other sites that are growing on the internet and products that are being built in companies. And the thing is, we know that the copyright law as it exists doesn't work for those companies, but what about the ones we haven't even thought of yet? It's, it's the next step in this process. What is going to be the next Google or Facebook or Reddit or pick an app on your iPhone? What's going to be the next iPhone? I mean, all, all of these things. What's coming down the pike is what's most concerning about where the, you know, the regime is right now, because it already doesn't work. If we're, if we're going to get serious about it, we have to start really taking a look at what we can do now to avoid the problems we see in the marketplace today from coming back and you know, getting even worse down the road. So that's, in, in our view, that's exactly where we need to be on copyright. We need to move the, the debate forward. Did you, before we move on, yes. I, uh, just mention, I actually uh, brought with me some copies of a a copyright uh, principles project report. Um, uh, in 2007, I put together a kind of private copyright reform effort myself, and I had representatives from Warner Brothers Entertainment, from Disney, from IBM, from Microsoft, 
uh, some practicing lawyers as well as some law professors. And we got to, together and we said, is, there, does, is copyright reform needed? And I was astonished at how many problems uh, people who were full-time copyright professionals thought that there was with the law. Um, and so we have in this report a set of principles that we think would govern a good copyright law. We then measure the existing copyright law by whether or not it matches up and in what respects it falls short. And then we have a set of recommendations, 25 recommendations for reform that should be considered. Uh, so I'll leave copies of that out on the table in case people would like to. So there's actually yeah. consensus, because you took one of my, my follow-up questions away, there's actually consensus around some of the things that were wrong. It wasn't just the copyright reformers thought it was too strong and the, and the copyright industry thought it was too weak. Yes. Oh, that's interesting, but good. Okay, well let me ask my next question, which is a two-part question, and I have a prop. So, the first part of the question is if, if you were, and you can wear this if you want, it belongs to my daughter, so it doesn't, it's, it's kind of snuggly. If you're the absolute monarch of the United States, what kind of copyright law would you mandate? So in other words, what would your ideal copyright universe look like, or copyright country look like? So, if you were the monarch, that's the, that's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, unfortunately, you're not the absolute monarch. <laughs> so what would be the three to five or less improvements, so surgical cuts, to copyright law that would make it better, that would, that would diminish some of the problems that you talked about uh, uh, in the first go-round? So why don't we start again, why don't we start with Tom this time? You want the, you want your, oh, sure. uh, okay, great. Are we only doing the uh, monarch question? Either one. Well, it's both. Okay. We answer both, and uh, or either one if you don't feel comfortable. Because the second, the second question really kind of gets at what are the some of the specific changes to copyright law uh, that you'd want to make. But uh, the first part of the question is, you know, if you were God or you were the monarch, you know, and you got to start a copyright regime from square one, if you believe there should be a copyright regime, uh, a protection of intellectual property, what would it look like? Okay. Um, I would go back to the 1790 Act, if I were vested with that awesome power that Gigi explained. And it's a much simpler act, and if we can, you can just see right there, that shows how elegant and lean the founders thought copyright could be. And if we can go to the next slide, we'll just see, there they are. It's a bit of hagiography, I admit. But I admire the founders, and they wrote into the Constitution that clause that is the premise for the authority Congress has to pass copyright law. They knew what they were doing. The 1790 Congress had many of the same people who wrote the Constitution. What are some of the virtues of the 1790 Copyright Act? A very short term, maximum of only 28 years. Here's a big shocker. Covers only maps, books, and charts. Basically all they cared about were documents that show you where to go and books. And that shows what a parsimonious view of copyright the founders, who again, put that clause in the Constitution. What a parsimonious view of copyright they had. They knew about it. They didn't think those things were worthy of protection. Now, they lived in a time of great cultural poverty. Back then, they did not have what we have in our pockets. Basically, everything they have at the Library of Congress and more at our fingertips. So they thought, we live in cultural poverty. We have to stimulate the creation of expressive works. And they only went as far as maps, books, and charts for 28 years. That's amazing to me. I think it's a real eye-opener. One more thing, they only protected those works against exact duplication. You wouldn't have to worry about derivative works. If you did a translation into German of an English work, you had a new work. So that's what I would take us back to if I could. I don't know if that's possible. Can we go to the next couple slides? So since you want details, there you go. I won't go through these in a great deal of detail because I bore you to death, but I know many of you write laws for a living. I suggest two things. 107B. The effects I'm looking for here are very subtle. It's restructuring the market for copyright works. And both these reforms are designed to kick people, excuse me, gently <laughs> nudge people towards the door out of the copyright regime into a common law regime where they rely on their, copy, on their common law rights, contract and tort rights to protect their expressive works. One, this 107B uh, would do that. If we can see the next slide, you'll see also 301G. Now, again, I'll explain, I'll explain these more fully in my book, Intellectual Privilege. Jerry's helped me publish this. The Mercatus Institute is coming out this summer. And by the way, the book is being released under 
1790 Copyright Act. We basically are revivifying the 1790 Copyright Act to protect this book. So 28 years, I'll be lucky if anybody reads it in year two, but in 28 years it'll be in the public domain and you all can copy it pell-mell. Actually, talk to me beforehand. I'm sure we can work something out. And? So I think I, I'm willing to protect more than maps, charts, and books. Um, uh, I like this uh, notion that original works of authorship um, are eligible for copyright protection. I think a big change that I would return to, um, because uh, I think there was some wisdom, uh, as Tom uh, has, uh, of the way the law used to be, uh, and that is to reinvigorate formalities in copyright law, uh, to have more registration, more inducement to uh, to formalities uh, like notices on copies and the like. And I'll just mention, and I'll leave this out on the the table too. Uh, we're having a conference in Berkeley this year about reinvigorating um, uh, formalities for the internet age. Uh, Mer um, not Meredith Peter, Maria Palante, um, the Register of Copyrights, is actually a keynote speaker. The Copyright Society of the United States is uh, one of the co-sponsoring entities for it, so we're really trying to reach across the board. We have a number of people from Europe about it uh, to uh, come and talk about it. And interestingly enough, uh, the Europeans right now are more interested in formalities uh, than they have ever been before. And so I think that you know the idea that you opt into copyright uh, by uh, registering your claim uh, is something that's a, a good uh, part of copyright law that we had in U.S. copyright law until 1989. So for uh, almost 200 years we had an opt-in system and that seems to me to be uh, a really good feature of, uh, of a good uh, of a good copyright law, which isn't to say that um, today I would say that if you don't register or you don't put notices on that it should necessarily fall into the public domain. Part of what we're trying to do is think creatively about what kinds of um, what kinds of, of baseline should there be and then what benefits do you get if you engage in formalization. Um, I'd also do some tailoring of the exclusive rights. I'd be more comprehensive and more thoughtful about the limitations and exceptions to copyright. So for example, why do 4-H clubs get uh, the right to perform music for free and not the campfire girls um, or whatever. There's, uh, if you look at sections 107 to 122, you'll see the most motley crew of, uh, of exceptions and you just sort of say, where do these come from? Uh, and, uh, and so I actually try to do something uh, much, more, uh, um, uh, much more systematic about it. Uh, and finally, I would do a very, very substantial reform of statutory damages. I think that's the single worst part of U.S. copyright law today, uh, and uh, I'll probably talk a little bit more about that. Um, um, can I do that now? Or yes, and, but I'd also, if you don't mind, uh, you know, the, do people understand what formalities is, that is registering it, registering the copyright and renewing that registration and other notices? But the, the, the response to that, when you talk about that as well, we're, we're parties to the Berne Convention, so therefore we cannot reinstitute formality. So finish what you were going to say, and then if you can answer my question, how do we get around the Berne problem if indeed it is a problem? Okay, so uh, statutory damages. Um, as I'm sure most of you in this room are aware of the $1.92 million award that was made against a, a teenager who uh, downloaded 24 songs. Um, this is made possible by uh, the U.S. statutory damage regime, which creates a baseline of $750 per infringed work uh, as a bare minimum and up to $150,000 per infringed work um, and uh, uh, while I think it's just grossly uh, excessive uh, as applied to this uh, particular file share, uh, what worries me more is that any company, any tech company that's trying to actually make some platform for looking at large number of works are basically facing uh, an enormous risk of statutory damages even for secondary infringement, that is to say they may not be infringing themselves, but if they're charged with secondary infringement by facilitating the infringing acts of others, uh, they face gazillion dollars of, uh, of statutory damages. Even uh, Google bet the company on the 
uh, on the, the um, uh, on it, with its Google Book Search project, um, they're facing as much as $3.6 trillion in statutory damages for something which, from my standpoint, has uh, caused no actual injury to any author uh, and has brought no profits to, uh, to Google. And so the idea that $3.6 trillion um, is hanging over their head is really something very, very deeply disturbing. I've been doing a study recently about statutory damages on, uh, on the international scale. And one thing I found is that only 14% of the com uh, com countries in the world have statutory regimes, and they all have much more and more sensible limits on their statutory damage regime than we do. Um, and that's a place where I think reform is really, really needed for uh, tech companies, for innovation, for internet companies. Um, that's where I think there's a kind of stranglehold on, uh, on innovation. And we'll hold the Brown question till later, but I'm sure Mike and Eric would have a lot to add about how statutory damages uh, affect speech, how they affect innovation. So why don't we start with Mike, and then we'll go to Eric. Well, you know, on the on the statutory damages question, I think that's something we absolutely have to be cognizant of changing. When you can get a hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine for downloading a song, or whatever it is, it's, it's completely insane. Especially moving into a situation where the younger generation of music consumers don't understand and will never understand probably what it means to own music. They think it comes over YouTube or in a best case scenario, Spotify, um, you know, or RDO or one of those services, or it, but it's freely available. You, you don't build a record collection anymore, um, things like that. So there's, there's that aspect of it. Uh, I will say that uh, ours will be a benevolent dictatorship, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think that it would, it, we'd build a copyright regime that, you know, looked a lot like Derek Hahn's RSC paper. Could you be a little more specific? I mean, it, it, basically rethinking with market influences and aspects what we could do for copyright. Looking at things like the Copyright Act of 1790, which I think is actually a, a, a pretty good baseline to start as rebuilding a regime that's been taken over by um, the deep-seated interests in this town and, and throughout the country that have seen to it that uh, Tom's very colorful chart keeps, you know, sliding ever further and higher to the right. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that we have to just totally look at how to rethink and rebuild that system. And, and you know, tear it down, build it again, do, that, do all that because, I mean, as I said in the beginning, and, and as I often say at these things, as the much more learned people to my right have already been saying, like, we're, we're in a system that doesn't work. We need, um, but we, we absolutely can't go forward, as, you, as Pam rightly pointed out, with a stranglehold on innovation because of a system that was built for people that bought records, you know, or conceived of owning, you know, a, a VHS tape, much less a DVD. You know that not not just having access to a library. It, it's time to rethink what it means to have your protections in place for sure, in in some way, but understanding that we've got this great thing called the internet that makes it better, faster, and stronger for all of us to experience all of this culture so much in, in, with so much more breadth and depth than we ever could before. And the last point that that I'll make on this is, you know, I have a day job as well. I'm, I'm a strategist for the Venture Capital Fund in San Francisco. And we work with real early stage, real leading edge kinds of companies. And um, the, you know, when they come to us and say, well, what do we need in terms of whether it's patent protection or whether it's just general IP or copyright trademarks, tell them to out-innovate the market in a lot of ways. Just just stay ahead of, of what you can do. Now, I mean, that's not saying, you know, don't protect yourself. But if you continue to build products that work from an entrepreneurial standpoint and that lead markets rather than become part of a market and change markets. All the protections in the world won't amount to much because you'll just be better than everybody else. And they'll be 18 months behind you, whatever you want to do. So innovation is the real key here. We need to build a system around that. We need to find and, 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 uh, and codify the way that the regulation and, and protection can work so that we don't strangle innovation, that we allow people to continue to thrive and grow, frankly, grow the economy. So Eric, I, I trust that uh, your uh, perfect copyright world would include some DNCA reform. 
Yes. Um, and definitely, definitely shortening, shortening terms, shortening the uh, damages. Uh, the other big components I would add is an actual penalty for abuse. Um, and because uh, right now there's basically none. And that all the data around that would be uh, public. So I, I don't know if that gets into formalities, but you know, we uh, uh, file a whole bunch of uh, really bad DMCA takedown notices that at least you're going to have to do that publicly where you can be uh, scrutinized for it uh, in the court of public opinion, if nothing else. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I'd like to see if, if I were wearing the, the crown is, is and, and, and it gets more complicated depending on the, on, on the medium, but uh, is, you know, that the original creators would have to have more, you know, they, they would have to basically sign their names to, to you know, before any, before anyone is sued for, uh, 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 you know, these kind of damages. So they would have a little more say, whether it's the, you know, the 15-person the game publisher that made the hit uh, app or game or, or tablet magazine or movie or whatever that is, that they would have to have some way to say, like, look, we I, this is my creation, this is my idea, this is my story, and I don't agree to it being used this way. Because when we actually talk uh, to the actual content creators, not the distributors, not the trade lawyers, but the actual content creators, most of the time they, they're on the side of their fans, they're on the side of innovation. So some sort of way for them to express that if they so choose to. So uh, Pam, let's get back to you about that question I asked before. You talked about uh, bringing back some formalities and I mentioned the argument that you know the Berne Convention is somehow, because we are signatories to it, somehow a, a a barrier to that. How do you get around that issue? Well, so there are a number of things that the Berne Convention provision that says that you can't condition the existence or exercise of copyright on formalities. That's the rule um, from uh, the Berne Convention. Uh, there are a number of things that it doesn't apply to. So it doesn't apply, for example, uh, to, uh, to corporate authored works. Um, and uh, second, we already have uh, formalities uh, that apply only to U.S. authors. Uh, so that, for example, in order to bring uh, a lawsuit for copyright infringement, an American author has to file a registration with the U.S. Copyright Office. And also, if you want to get statutory damages or attorney's fees, you need to register your claim of copyright, um, and you can only get them sort of if you file promptly. Uh, and so those are existence of, uh, of formalities already in U.S. law, and we can do to our own citizens whatever we think is actually a sensible thing to do. Um, and so the Berne Convention doesn't require us not to do that to ourselves. It just means that formalities would not be uh, applicable um, to uh, to foreign nationals' works, uh, and so we we already do that for the sort of the filing of a lawsuit. Uh, a foreign author can bring a lawsuit without having a uh, registered claim of copyright, and so um, there are, I think, a lot of things that we could do that, as long as we think it's a sensible thing to do, and I think formalities make a huge amount of sense, um, uh, we can do a lot of things within the Bern framework, but also there is, I think, an international conversation starting about whether or not we should change the Berne Convention in this respect. And here's a really important thought that um, uh, has now been expressed in a book by a young Dutch scholar, uh, his name is Stefan Gumpel. Uh, he's written a book about the history and philosophy of formalities, and many of us think, oh, the Europeans, they never like uh, formalities. Um, <laughs> um, uh, it's a content industry, biting back. I was going to say, they're coming towards <laughs> uh, That they're against formalities, and uh, the Berne Convention um, uh, is completely inconsistent with having formalities. And that turns out not to be true. It turns out to be the case uh, that the, his the history shows that the reason the Berne Convention adopted a no formalities rule was because at the time it was so difficult, cumbersome, expensive to comply with the formalities rules of each individual country because you wanted to start getting international trade and in copyrighted works. It was just too burdensome. 
What we have now is a situation in which all those burdens can easily be overcome because we can all use the internet. So the World Intellectual Property Organization is starting uh, an investigation of formalities. A number of European countries uh, are beginning to develop registries and registry systems that will distinguish between things that are registered and things not registered. So we're actually in the United States a little behind the curve, but I'm going to try to change that through my conference. So if you want to know about it will be on the internet. Tom, do you have anything to add about formalities at all? And then if, if, if you do and even if you don't, I would like you to walk us through your specific, you kind of zip through them, your specific uh, oh, okay. uh, prescriptions for reforming the surgical cuts. Sure. You asked me about formalities? Yes. Do you have oh. anything to add to what I was delighted to hear uh, about your, your work. Uh, Professor Samuelson's doing the, the Lord's work there, as far as I'm concerned. Keep it up. I would say, though, I don't understand why we have to stay in Bern. I know that sacrosanct almost every copyright scholar I've ever talked to. But here's the problem I have with Bern. What's Bern designed to do? It's designed to open up foreign markets to domestic authors and copyright holders, right? So they get more money from overseas sales when we accede to Bern. Okay, I have no problem with that. But when that happens, we should be ratcheting down domestic protections. Assuming we have achieved some sort of balance, even if it's not delicate, some sort of balance in copyright, we're saying, public, we're taking from you some of the rights you would otherwise have to copy these works. We're going to give to these authors and rights holders these, these special privileges because we want to stimulate their production of these expressive works. Well, look, if you're going to increase the awards given to creating expressive works, you can lower the amount of protection you afford. And that never happens with burn. It's always, as you've seen with the, it's the same thing with, that we saw with the term. It's protections always ratchet up, ratchet up, ratchet up. So I think we should consider leaving burn. But I'll stop with that. That's radical enough. You want to hear about Would this? you mind, yeah. Okay. Would you walk us through? Do you want to go back one? Sure. Yeah, let's go back one. So here the idea is very simply that if, well, let me back up. Here's what you can do under copyright right now. You can license your work to someone and say, by clicking OK, you're giving up all your fair use rights. By clicking OK, you are giving up the right, for example, to criticize this work in public. Now, this is not very common, although it does happen. Or you, by clicking OK, you can't make, I've seen this in licenses, you can't make any use of this material, not even minimal quotes. And the concern is, although you could not get by with doing that simply under the statute, right? If I, I'm sure you'd never do this. But if I decided to take a short quote from Professor Samuelson's paper here, I would just hide under the fair use defense. But if she had a license imposed on this, kind of a shrink wrap license where I clicked OK, where I can't quote anything, she could come after me under contract law. So that's too much. That's combining the statutory rights with common law rights. And what this does is says, you have to cut bait or fish. We're not going to give you two trips to the banquet. Either you go with just copyright, or if you want more than copyright will give you, you want to limit fair use rights, that's fine. We'll let you do that, but you have to give up your copyright rights and rely solely on your common law rights. Why would anyone like this? Well, for one thing, it kind of decreases the power afforded to copyright holders. And I think, all told, that's, it's about time for that. And secondly, more importantly, as I said, it's a subtle effect. The idea is to encourage the development of business models that do not rely on statutory protections. I want to see a whole class of entrepreneurs arise where they say, you know, I don't want to fool around with the statute. They keep changing the rules, it's terribly complicated, I've got to hire attorneys every time I do anything, and even then I don't understand what my rights are. I know I can throw people in jail and that's cool, but I'm not sure how often and how much. So I'm just going to rely on my contract rights. I'm going to encourage people to develop those business models. So that's what this does, and then the next one pretty much does the same thing. It just reassures people who go to this business model, relying solely on their contract and tort law and property rights, it says to them that if you put your work in the public domain, have at it. We're not going to come after you under federal law saying, what you've done is too much like copyright. You can't do that under state law. We're going to use the supremacy clause to shut you down. This says, please develop those business models so we can get you out of Washington and back in Silicon Valley. We can get you back to innovating and away from lobbying. That's the kind of market I want to see develop, one where we use the tools that are already on the table. In fact, they're kind of superpowered now. Maybe the founders had to have copyright because they didn't have the internet. They didn't have click-through licenses. We do now. You can do wonderful things with common law rights that they could not do, and it's led to me to believe maybe we don't need as much copyright. In fact, it's led me to believe we really don't need as much copyright <laughs> as we have. 
if Pam wanted to follow up on that. So one other thing actually that this report of the Copyright Principles Project does is addresses this question about efforts to use contract or mass market licenses to override fair use and other limitations and exceptions, uh, the rights that users would otherwise have. And we came up with a formulation for uh, how to think about uh, when it should be copyright uh, should override contract. And so that's a little bit different approach, but still the recognition that there's some often some conflict between uh, what copyright law would do, which gives users some rights, uh, and what uh, uh, licenses sometimes do, which is try to override those rights, and how do you mediate those tensions. Um, I'll also put in a, another plug for it, which is that we also came to consensus about uh, about reinvigorating formalities. Uh, so uh, big companies, uh, and I think small companies, um, as long as the formalities are not onerous, um, uh, and confiscatory, I think uh, people can support uh, reinvigorating formalities. Is there anywhere online we can get those? Uh... Yes, it's all online. Um, it's called the Copyright Principles Project Directions for Reform. It's available on SSRN. So, Eric, so as I said before, Reddit is the front page of the internet. And obviously there's a, a, the web, and there's a lot of uh, you know, conversation about copyright reform. Obviously it was a huge foment uh, of organization and discussion around SOPA and PIPA, and that's the last time I'm going to mention SOPA and PIPA in this panel, because I don't want it. This is about reform, not what happened a year ago, although I didn't mind what happened a year ago. But what are pe when, when people are talking about copyright and copyright reform on Reddit, what do they care about? What, what are the things, other than saying no, what do they say yes to? Because to me, that's the challenge, right? The challenge is it's a lot easier to defeat a bill than it is to, you know, to get one passed. So our challenge as advocates for copyright reform is how do we get even half the number of people that came out against mm -mm -mm, uh, to come out in favor of something? Well, so I mean, I think the most exciting thing they say yes to is they say yes to good business models that give people good service and let them buy what they want to buy. I mean, that's. We see that all the time, free to play, and then people pay for other things. I mean, they, they say yes to, you know, all kinds of things, Kickstarters. They say yes to, you know, directly funding uh, musicians. They say yes to, you know, they, they give us uh, uh, us money to support the site in addition to advertising. Um, they don't have to. So they, they say yes to a lot of things with their with their credit cards and PayPals and, and cash. And that's, that's what's really exciting. And, you know, there's not a lot of things to say yes to in that innovative business model space from you know from the big uh, content companies and I think that's that's what's really frustrating uh, and you know we have a pretty international audience um, who gets really frustrated because it's super complicated to even know you know where to look for you know certain shows or books or games uh, online if they want to pay for it um, so uh, you know that that's what's what's exciting for us to see and Mike, how about your members? I mean, what, what will, I know you're up here, Morning Tech Report today, you're talking about immigration reform, which is obviously really critical. I assume you're talking about patent reform, which is all the rage, in, not just in Silicon Valley, but Silicon Alley, and Austin, and any place where there's high tech. But when it comes to copyright reform, you know, what are your members telling you that they, that they would say yes to, that they would come to the Hill and, and, and march the halls of this Congress in favor of and, and, and spread out to their networks and tell them to do the same? Well, so on, on the on the copyright front, we made sort of a decision when we got Engine off the ground to do a lot of the other issues that you talked about, immigration and patent, and the fact that patent is all the rage, by the way, is kind of kind of fun because it is very important and now people are starting to like get around that we actually need this kind of thing. We, we looked at copyright, and especially coming out of the great internet, you know, thing of last year, apparently won't name. Um, <laughs> coming out of that it, shall not be named. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, what, but coming out of that, we learned that we've got to teach people on both sides of this about what the internet really is. And so we made a conscious decision to choose issues in cons consultation with our members that were telling us, like, I got real problems on immigration, I got real problems on patent, I got real problems with you know, financial regulation, which was the Jobs Act last year, and things like that. And said, we will, we will let people more learned than ourselves, as I often would say, especially you, fight the good fight on copyright, 
and keep it, you know, in a, in a manageable level. But what we want is more people walking the halls in this building who get why it's different now. And what that means is teaching them about the products we build, the companies we started, where we are, how we do what we do. The business models that are allowing people to not just survive but thrive in ways that we never conceived of before, whether as a content creator or, or a web developer or, or a you know new and fledgling company, whatever it is. Um, and then we want to have a conversation about copyright when we're all a little bit further down the line. Now, at the same time, we're going out to our members and saying, and here's how you can most effectively work with our friends in Congress and in the regulatory agencies and the White House and in government at the federal and state and local level instead of the traditional Silicon Valley view and entrepreneurial view of putting blinders on and just hoping that they don't notice that you're over here doing stuff and maybe just maybe your business will succeed despite the fact that around here sometimes it's seek first to regulate more than seek first to understand. So we want to build that understanding, we want to build that trust, we want on both sides, we want to be here to educate us why we're doing events like Startup Day on the Hill, and I invite you all to come to that after you're done here today. We'll have stuff all over Capitol Hill um, uh, for the next two days. Uh, but it, in our view, it really is about education and about trying to figure out the best way for regulation and legislation to be crafted going forward that helps not just the business models that have, we've already started to see pick up, but the ones we haven't thought of yet, the, the products we haven't thought of yet, the companies we haven't thought of yet, that will provide frameworks where they can um, survive. That, when we do talk about copyright, that's what our membership will stand up for. They will stand up for a regime that works, that for changes that can help their bottom line. They'll come here in droves to talk about that. I would. I'm perfectly happy to help the internet find its pitchforks and torches. Um, and, you know, I'm sure Eric is too and the rest of us when necessary and we'll fight if there's another bill like that which shall not be named, which would have had, you know, it, not just a chilling effect, but real, done real damage to innovation generally and especially to the startup economy. We'll, we'll fight that fight if we have to. We would rather not. We would much rather that we got a chance to get people understanding what's going on and then work together and collaboratively to build a regime that works. That's a great answer. So let me just shift just a little bit and let's talk about international and what's going on overseas. You see the UK sort of completely rethinking uh, its copyright regime. You see the Hadopi three strikes law uh, falling apart in France. You saw protests against ACTA you know, all over the world except in the United States. Yet here, you know, we had Sopo and Pippa last year. We signed ACTA. We're now negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Uh, the ISPs in the content industry just instituted a voluntary uh, graduated response regime. So we're a little bit behind. But is the ground shifting? And will what's happening overseas, will it have what happened? Or non-expressive uses, so computational uses of uh, uh, of works uh, that we can learn new things from. Uh, some of you probably have used the Ngram viewer uh, to see what kinds of word usages uh, have happened over time. Uh, that that's uh, essentially a an application on top of the Google Books uh, corpus. Uh, so um, uh, also uh, Singapore and Israel have recently uh, adopted a fair use. Uh, provision Canada has uh, uh, has expanded its uh, fair dealing provisions so that it's much more like uh, a U.S. Uh, fair use defense. And uh, I know that a number of the countries who are part of the uh, APEC group, the Asia Pacific um, Economic uh, Council, Council, um, uh, those countries are also looking at fair use. So some of the good ideas of American copyright law are actually spreading to some of those other places and I think those are developments that are really worth uh, noting. Um, I think one of the most important things that's happened in the international arena was the European Parliament's vote against uh, ACTA and that was not only important uh, for Europe uh, because the European Commission officials that had negotiated that uh, uh, participated in the negotiations had been willing to negotiate something that was going to bind all members of the European Union without consulting with the European Parliament at all. They would violate 
supposedly national security if they if the negotiators even talked to their legislators about what they were in the process of negotiating. That kind of lack of transparency, I think, and public knowledge has done a great job trying to say, we've got to have more transparency. It is not fair uh, to have international treaties negotiated uh, where there isn't uh, some ability to see what the proposals are and to say, would we want to be bound by these rules? And if we wouldn't want to be bound by these rules, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be uh, trying to bind other people to some of these rules. And you know, it's a way of kind of essentially subverting the, um, the, the legislative process domestically by allowing the trade representatives to go off and negotiate things that actually are not in the best interest of our own economy, let alone the economy of the world. Yeah, I mean, you, you've really picked up on one of the most vexing issues for us is how to affect trade policy. I mean, we're not trade lawyers, right? We do communications and, and copyright, and we have found USTR to be a complete and total black hole. You know, they, they'll give us a little piece of candy every once in a while, and then they'll, you know, kick us uh, where it hurts. So if anybody has any ideas on that, how do we, how do we, I mean, I think it takes leadership, right? I mean, you know, Ambassador Kirk's a very nice guy, but you know, he wasn't the, the guy who was going to come in and say, "Look, you know, we're we're treating you know intellectual products like we treat soybean and corn. There's something wrong with that." And I don't know how you fix that other than getting you know they had Peter Cowie, who's a professor at University of uh, California San Diego, to come in and essentially change the culture there. He lasted one year. So um, if anybody has any thoughts about you know how we fix that policy laundering problem, and when I say policy laundering, I mean taking laws we can't get here and going overseas either through WIPO or some other multilateral process or through trade agreements, getting it there and then coming back here and saying, ooh, we signed this treaty, we signed this trade agreement, so now you must pass this onerous law. Please, weigh in. I don't have a solution to that problem, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and, and your comments are so well put on that front. But I will say there are some interesting developments at the WTO. In fact, there's a panelist coming up, and Andrew Shore, who's worked with the Antiguan um, gambling folks and at Antigua they managed this through the WTO process to basically start giving away American copyrighted goods online and I'm not sure exactly what I think about that. I, I had so radical even I uh, kind of <laughs> got stopped. But, you know, it's an interesting development and uh, I'm watching that with a great deal of interest. Eric or Mike, do you have anything else to add? Subject of, I mean, I, I, don't, I think the TPP was very uh, was a big article of discussion on Reddit, and go ahead, Mike. If Acta, okay. Acta and TPP have both been a lot of discussion happening on Reddit, and I think it's actually, you know, it's a, it's a testament to the front page of the internet that this is where the substantive discussions were really happening about these bills. I mean, a lot of the the news that we were getting, what little would come out of USTR, which you know was smuggled out in the middle of the night, or you know probably just left out with the trash, whatever it was, on. But it would show up on Reddit, and then you would have these conversations that would happen, and be like, well, you know, okay, how are we going to activate? How are we going to do this? That's a very powerful tool for those of us in this community who care about this to have. Is just a a place and a a way to convene. It's the reason we started Engine was to bring together the startup community to convene on this and meet with government. Reddit's a great tool for that. Uh, we'd love to see some mix of that that's you know springing up in other countries as. Um, the the sort of consciousness on this continues to proliferate around, and, and you know different countries and and you know international organizations begin to um, to take you know stances on this. So I think it's it's just important to build you know sort of the copyright civil society as it were internationally, so that there are folks that will get on a subreddit and say, hey, I heard about this. This seems bad. Let's talk about it. What can we do? And it just, it's so easy now to do that and get activated that the more light we bring on to this as a community internationally, I think it's going to be good. And the, you know, and, and the same thing on the positive side, I think, you know, that, that may, you know, I, I think that may end up being one of the biggest uh, impacts is that there will be places that, that take a more, uh, you know, sort of innovation-centric approach to copyright, and we'll start to see new businesses there. And, and I, you know, unfortunately, I think that may not be here. But we're going to start to see those, and we're going to start to see data come out of other countries that, that take a yeah uh, that take a digital approach to these things. 
Let me uh, focus in on something that might be possible. It hasn't been mentioned by anybody here as possible copyright reform, but I think actually uh, has a chance of, of moving forward. In fact, it almost passed in 2008, and that's orphan works reform. <laughs> And this is a very sore spot for me because uh, a very good orphan works bill passed the Senate in 2008. Uh, and I remember walking the streets of Winchester, Virginia, uh, campaigning door to door for uh, then Senator Obama, uh, begging Howard Berman to put the, the Senate bill on the suspension calendar so it would become law, and he refused to do it. And I'm still his friend, uh, but in any event, it was a very bitter, bitter pill to swallow. Uh, but there's talk about Orphan Works making a comeback. Is that possible? And if it is possible, I hear that you know one of the main proponents of Orphan Works back in 2008, the libraries aren't interested anymore. They're concerned that a bill would be let down with a lot of requirements and they'd rather rely on fair use. So, so what are the possibilities? Dan, you want to start? So I think that part of what's happened in the last uh, several years, 2006 was when the Copyright Office came up with a report about orphan works. Um, uh, these are works that you can't find the copyright owner once you try to look for them. Um, and right now there are a lot of works that are still in copyright formally, uh, but uh, in fact the rights holders can't be found. Uh, either can't, you don't know who created the work or you, uh, the, the company went out of business or the author died or went to um, the hinterlands of West Virginia or something. Um, so uh, what to do? Uh, libraries, educational institutions, archives, historical societies, many of them want to be able to make some of these materials available on the internet. Uh, we actually had a wonderful conference uh, last year at Berkeley about orphan works and uh, somebody from the uh, one of the early civil rights groups had these boxes of documents, including pictures, uh, about the early history of the civil uh, rights movement. They wanted to put them up on the internet, but they were scared to because of copyright. So um, uh, the legislation, uh, as you say, was introduced. It looked like it was going to get close to passing. Um, it didn't. Uh, in the meantime, people have basically been saying, look, we'll try to do some searches for some of these rights holders. If we can't find it, we're going to actually make fair uses of them. And so fair use has, in fact, stepped up and uh, filled in some of the gap. And even the Library of Congress has been relying on fair use to make uh, some orphan works uh, available. Uh, so I think fair use now is part of the solution space, but I don't think fair use goes far, goes far enough. I still think some legislation would be uh, desirable um, for commercial users of, uh, of uh, orphan works, and particularly commercial users that would create derivative works. Um, so uh, one of the features of the last orphan works bill that I think was a really good one, which is that if you really thought that this, uh, uh, let's say, movie made out of a short story that was published in 1933, you tried to find rights holder, you couldn't. Uh, you go ahead um, and make use of it uh, under what was then the, the Orphan Works legislation. Um, uh, you make this fabulous movie. It turns out that the rights holder finally shows up. They can't enjoin the movie. Um, they can get some compensation for the value um, that they added to the work. Um, and so that's actually a fair trade because then the public is not deprived of uh, further access to the work and also the, uh, the rights holder in the derivative work can basically say, look, I'll pay you this fair share of uh, the value, but I deserve, some, uh, I deserve some compensation too because I made this investment, I've got, a, got good stars and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I added value here. So we all win and not just one entity. So I think that it's really more for the creative reuses, especially commercial uses, um, that would probably uh, not fall within fair use, that Orphan Works legislation would be um, desirable. And I think the libraries might um, uh, be willing to support something like that as long as there was some recognition that fair use does play an important role in the orphan works space also. Yeah, for those of you that are not familiar with orphan works legislation, what it would do is it would take works that are under copyright, 
but for which the copyright owner could not be found, and said instead of subjecting them to the statutory dam, the huge statutory damages that you heard about before, you just have to compensate, uh, provide reasonable compensation. If the owner, in the very unlikely case they come to the fore and say this is mine, uh, they would get compensated as opposed to having statutory damages available to them. Okay, one last question, and that's about the uh, Copyright Office's recent decision uh, to remove the exemption from unlocking cell phones. So one might ask, this is the DMCA exemption, one might ask, well, why did the Copyright Office grant an exemption in the first place for unlocking cell phones? And if they granted it, you'd hip hip hooray for those of us who like interoperability and the ability to take your cell phone from one carrier to the next, is why in God's name did they get rid of it? Should they have been there in the first place? I mean, should it even be a question whether unlocking cell phones is a violation of the DMCA? Why don't we just go down the from Mike and and just one minute? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna see to a lawyer on this question first, and then I'll come back. But uh, I mean, uh, we need to promote these uh, we need to promote these ideas and, and be able for interoperability purposes. We're moving into into a you know a situation where we're going to be jumping between carriers or you know switching devices, you know, or traveling internationally in ways that we never were before. But uh, I will leave with you. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, developed a set of rules about be making it illegal to bypass a technical protection measure uh, that some copyright owner was using to protect their work. Um, the idea that gave rise to the legislation in the first place uh, was that many uh, content owners uh, were unwilling to make uh, digital content available uh, unless they had the reassurance that a technical protection measure would uh, control unlimited copying of them. And so the, in the content scramble system uh, that uh, is uh, available for uh, protecting DVD movies from uh, being uh, copied easily um, uh, is an example of a TPM uh, that you're not supposed to bypass um, uh, to make unlawful uses of it. So it was supposed to be trying to stop copyright infringement and that was all it was supposed to be doing. It was supposed to be a kind of pre preventive measure um, and what's happened of course is that TPMs are now used Technical protection measures are used in all kinds of things, uh, and so uh, the idea that you should be able to like um, control the the um, the sort of the bypassing of those technical measures is something that the law granted a very very broad uh, right to control, uh, and uh, and so the you know at the the last copyright office proceeding they said this isn't about piracy. So, you know, uh, so I think that's why they granted an exemption. And then probably the content owner said, we don't like any exceptions to those. So it's the, uh, the telephone companies, right? Right, yeah. It's anti, anti competitive, is what it is. Yeah. And so, um, so I, you know, this is not copyright's business. There is actually an interoperability exception uh, to the DMCA, but uh, it has not been, shall I say, utilize effectively uh, to deal with this. And so um, I think the Copyright Office in some sense weighing in on something that really isn't part of their mandate. But uh, that's what happens when you get an overbroad law. Yep. Tom and, and uh, Eric, real quickly. Uh, I won't uh, comment on the specific specifics of that, but I'll just say it shows how dismaying uh, the copyright has become. It's basically become this huge regulatory regime administered by yet another federal agency. And you folks here in the room may not keenly appreciate this, but when you get very far from D.C., these edicts are not well received. They come from out of the blue. They seem uninformed. And at any rate, they're extremely complicated. We have an expert in the field, and he's saying, I'm putting to the lawyers. It doesn't have to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. It should be a lot simpler. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised to see them, them using that. I mean, we see the DMCA used for, for links. Uh, we see the DMCA used for plot spoilers. We see the DMCA used for... Uh, you know, all kinds of things that it wasn't, you know, much beyond its original intent because it was so broad. And that's Taking like, down NASCAR uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. photos of big major crashes, yeah. <laughs> so no, I'm not surprised. So anyway, thank you everybody. Public Knowledge has its own copyright reforms on the internet blueprint.org and thanks for everything, thanks for coming. And thanks for having us. One more panel about copyright law and copyright law reforms. 
this is this is about the first sale doctrine. And uh, earlier today, Michael, an intelligent guy, said that the first sale doctrine is one of the most important copyright issues that's facing us in the in the future today. Now, what would possess him to say something like that? When 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 you know, we think about copyright, we think about protecting artists, we think about fair use, we think about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Why is first sale uh, sort of this important? Uh, next step. So we have a distinguished panel to discuss exactly that issue, why it's so important. We have Christina Mulligan, who is a fellow at the Yale Information Society Project, uh, Andrew Shore, who's the executive director of the Owners' Rights Initiative, and Brandon Butler, who's director of public policy initiatives at the Association of Research Libraries. So first sale, a doctrine that allows us to uh, have lending libraries, have used bookstores, to have DVD rentals uh, in, enshrined in U.S. law since at least 1908. But what is it? Why does it? How does it work? And why do we have it? Uh, Christina, can you start us off? And Andrew and uh, uh, Brandon, just feel free to jump in right after. Sure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what first sale is, and then I'm going to give you four reasons why it's a good thing. Uh, the first sale doctrine is the idea that once you buy something, the previous owner or the person who manufactured it can't dictate how you use it, whether you can resell it. Um, once you have it, it belongs to you. And the origins of first sale uh, come before we had intellectual property. It's actually an idea from uh, personal property law in order that exists to protect the rights and interests of downstream purchasers of objects. And the reasons behind this, reason number one that you should like for sale, is that it promotes um, economic efficiency and lowers the transaction costs of buying and selling goods. And these are sort of big, big economic words, but you know we can intuitively understand this just from our own personal experiences. When you have a pen or you have a coffee mug, you don't think to yourself, now wait, um, is this coffee mug licensed to be used by my house guest? I can't remember. I don't want to go beyond my allowed uses of the coffee mug. Oh darn it, was this the pencil that I owned free and clear, or was this the one I can't use on Saturdays or Sundays, the weekday only pencil? We don't think about things like that because it sounds crazy, and because personal property law generally doesn't allow uh, manufacturers or previous owners to put usage restrictions on what you can do with objects. And the reason behind this is sort of obvious, because you would go crazy trying to figure out what you can and can't do with everything. It would be extremely costly and generally very economically inefficient. So one reason first sale is great in a property or in an intellectual property context, if you have a book or a CD or a record, um, is that it lets people do things fairly easily and understand what the scope of their rights are. Uh, in an intellectual property context specifically, there's three more reasons why we might really like first sale. One is it promotes the availability of works at low or available prices. So without first sale, you wouldn't necessarily have libraries, you wouldn't necessarily, necessarily have secondary sales of um, works at, excuse me, on eBay or secondhand stores. And as we know from our own experiences as children, or maybe when we were in college, a lot of works are available at lower prices than they might have originally been, which lets uh, knowledge become more accessible to more people. Second, it preserves access to a work when the original uh, copyright owner might not be present or no longer be making it available. So, you know, we're all familiar. Sometimes there's a book, uh, often in fiction or nonfiction, that was popular, say, in the 70s, and there's nobody making it now. The only way to get it is to buy it from a second hand, someone who bought it previously. Um, and you know, this is a very important value when it comes sort of to historical things. Sometimes there aren't people making works available who have the right to. And so first sale has an important role in preserving knowledge in this fashion. And third, it promotes innovation, the ability of people to use things um, in ways that the original uh, previous owner or the original manufacturer might not have anticipated people could use them. And this is also a good thing because it promotes advances in science and technology and makes things more efficient. So, uh, so those are the, the reasons why we have first sale. But can we talk a little bit about, well, how, why do we need first sale in order to do those things? What prevents people from doing those things just ordinarily? So, I mean, uh, what, what is it about copyright law that requires us to have this 
particular doctrine? How does it stop people from innovating, from having low prices, from from uh, from these efficiencies? So, in a in a traditional context, people uh, the copyright statute did not give copyright owners, the people that made works, the right to control uses of the work. They would control the ability to reproduce and distribute the work, um, but once you had it, you would not be able to control. Further, further distributions, and that's because of section, both the, limita the limited scope of the rights the copyright owners have, and also section 109 of the Copyright Act, which, ma which makes that explicit. But even before then, common law judges in 1908 uh, acknowledged that due to regular property law, uh, first sale was a, a value that existed perhaps even without the copyright statute specifying it. Um, do you want to go into the digital, how it's different in digital context I think now? Or do we you might pick that up in okay. a minute, because you mentioned section 109, right? And section 109 is, is what is sort of the embodiment of what the first sale doctrine is today, right? And that's been on the books since uh, 1976 or so, since the 76 Act. And, uh, but why, if it's been on the books since 1976, why are we talking about this right now? There's a Supreme Court case interpreting this language that's been sitting there for a few decades. How is it controversial now? Um, so we've got a Supreme Court case, Wiley and Sons versus Kurt Sang, uh, and it has real uh, effects for, it seems, uh, libraries and retailers and all sorts of people. And uh, Brandon, Andrew, did you want to talk a little bit about that? <laughs> you, do, you do a good shtick on this one. Good, uh... <laughs> Can you tell, Andrew and I have been doing meetings. We've probably met with some of you about this already. So and the rest of you are entertainment lobbyists who are here just to follow me home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> So we've been talking about this for a while now because of this case. So uh, what's going on in the Kurtzine case is that uh, we have a very uh, uh, self-starting young man named Supak Kurtzine, uh, who uh, is a Thai national who's here in the U.S. going to school, and he uh, wrote home to his family and said, you know, gosh, my textbooks here in the States sure are expensive. Uh, what do they cost when you buy them back home? And it turns out they cost a lot less. And these are legit textbooks, right? The real deal, licensed by Wiley. These aren't counterfeits. Um, but they're you know, printed a little bit more cheaply and priced lower to be uh, acceptable on the Thai market, right? Um, so the family buys, up, uh, buys a copy for Supap, and he says, now wait a minute. There's a huge difference here in these prices. Are there more on the shelf? Can you buy a few more? And I'll start selling them to my friends here in the States. And uh, so Supap got a pretty nice good business going there. Um, buying these uh, uh, copies, again, legit copies, retail, right? He's not stealing them from the printer before they get to the store. He's buying them uh, the way anybody would. Um, and then shipping them back home, uh, shipping them to the States, and then selling them online. And uh, Wiley brought a lawsuit saying, wait a minute, uh, we have a right to control importation of, our, of these books, right? We can exclude these books from the market. Um, and Kurt Sain's defense is the first sale doctrine. Uh, he says, look, uh, we bought these fair and square. These are legit copies. Uh, we're not. We're we're way downstream in the stream of commerce here. I didn't I didn't play any tricks on you. Uh, I'm not under any contract with you. I'm a normal buyer. I should be able to turn around and sell this copy that I got. And that's that's where we are now in the Kurtzang case. Is this dispute over whether the first sale doctrine protects works that were uh, printed abroad? And the origin of this of this controversy is that there are. Uh, two unfortunate, uh, three unfortunate words in section 109, right? So what kinds of works are subject to the first sale doctrine? And it's works that are lawfully made under this title. And those three words are sort of uh, opaque, right? We don't know, it's not clear whether they mean, uh, would they be lawful had this title applied, no matter where they are, right? Um, are they lawful, on, uh, or, or as courts have so far, unfortunately, in the district level interpreted it, does it mean lawfully made where this title applies, i.e. here in the United States? Um, if that latter interpretation uh, is, is upheld by the Supreme Court, though, what that's going to mean is that not only people like Mr. Kurtzang, um, who maybe are, are making money with this, but sort of anyone who is uh, buying things lawfully that are made abroad, even if those things are sold for the first time here in the U.S., right? Because all that matters is where it's made, not where it's sold. Um, all, every good that is made abroad will suddenly uh, no longer be subject to the first sale doctrine, which creates um, chaos, you know, dogs and cats living together. So we're uh, really concerned about what's going to happen if the court gets this wrong. Right. At that point, you have to rely on fair use, and, and that means every single good is subject 
to a to, well, subject to a subjective, sorry for the redundancy, subjective test. Um, and it's just not as clean as the first sale doctrine. And part of the problem with goods that are coming across the border is, um, you know, multiple parties could have rights to a particular good. So it's never as clean as saying that there's a single copyright holder to a particular work that was then made overseas and, and shipped into the United States. You could have four or five different people like you do with movies um, and music. Different people are assigned different levels of rights in order to publicize the movie and sell the DVD and all of those types of things. So <clears throat> a world without <clears throat> first sale and a first sale doctrine that protects consumers immediately after that first sale, that legitimate first sale has been made, is uh, completely chaotic. It's not a world that policymakers want to wake up in. Well, okay, so but you're talking about consumers and, and your concerns about them. Kurt Tang is an end consumer, right? He's a reseller. And for another matter, he's importing works, right? I mean, you know, there's a section in the Copyright Act that says, if you're importing something, you're distributing it, and you need the permission of a copyright holder to do that. I mean, how how is it that uh, that this that that first sale should override that? Well, the problem is that the there ought to be right the the counter argument to all of the concerns that we're raising is that uh, there is a legitimate interest, and I absolutely believe that this is true. Uh, there are good public policy reasons for folks to sell things at different prices in different places, right? And the question is, how do they preserve that right, and to what extent should they be able to preserve that right? And so there's a whole arsenal of uh, legal tools at the disposal of the folks who want to sell things abroad and ensure that when they, for example, license someone to print 100,000 copies, that guy who printed the 100,000 doesn't turn around and mail them back to the US, right? So there are ways for them to really try to control their uh, supply chain in pretty, um, in, in pretty powerful ways. Uh, the question is, should that go so far that once there is this lawful sale, uh, the control continues, in essence, forever, right? I mean, we're not even just talking about Kurt Sang. The people who buy the books from Kurt Sang would also be subject to this problem. Right. So if uh, the other, you know, the, the, the other kinds of problems that we have, and, and there were other cases about this before, um, are where you, know, you lawfully buy things uh, from someone like Overstock.com, right? And uh, that thing, if it was made abroad, even though you bought it on a U.S. website, um, that thing could be subject to copyright protection. A, a better example that we often use is Goodwill, who's a member of the coalition. Okay, um, hang on, but we're talking about you know products at Goodwill, right? How right, many of those sure. are copyrighted? It could be <laughs> all all everything. It could be a, a T-shirt with a logo on it. It could be a pair of jeans that that now has a copyright affixed to it. And the problem with Goodwill is one, they don't buy anything. Okay, everything is donated, so they don't know where anything comes from. Everything is potentially not resellable, and because you can't tell what things were licensed how once it gets sufficiently downstream, then people are paralyzed and feel like they can't do anything because it's just too costly to figure out uh, what you can and can't do with stuff. Right, and it, it ties back finally to the last panel when uh, we were talking about the problem with no formalities uh, for copyright. So sort of everyone has copyrights all the time and uh, any, any crazy person can assert their copyrights, right? And so. Uh, you're sort of at the you're at the whim of the craziest possible copyright owner. It's not just sophisticated, uh, you know, sophisticated businesses. It's you can get a CMV from any uh, wacko, and that sort of sets you off down this road of wondering how to change the way you do business. Randy, uh, yeah, Andrew mentioned some specific lawsuits. <laughs> Did you want to? Yeah, libraries get sued, man. Uh, so uh, a lot, uh, a lot more than you would have thought. Um, this is a relatively novel uh, development, but um, it's it's it coincides with the the general rise in copyright angst around the world because of new technology, right? So libraries are are fairly determined to. Uh, make our collections useful in, in, in any way that we can and we rely on fair use for example to do things like digitize um, and to support teaching with digital versions of uh, books in the library and things like that and there are 
two or three major lawsuits pending in federal appeals courts right now. I'm, I'm you know, beating the pavement every day, putting together amicus briefs and, and working on this. So it's not, it's not at all uh, a fantasy that libraries could get sued over copyright. And you know, I love fair use. Like we, we live and die by it. We are all of these briefs are about how important fair use is, but uh, it's hard to litigate. You know, it is a challenge. And when we have a, a, a sort of fundamental, clear, um, bedrock principle like first sale, that makes our lives a lot easier, right? We can focus on the interesting, cutting edge stuff with fair use, but we need that bedrock principle of first sale to get our jobs done in a very basic way.